to welcome everyone out today, and as most of you can tell, I'm not Chairman Thompson. Um, Chairman Thompson called me a little while ago. He's on his way to Baptist Hospital to have surgery on his knee. He injured his knee this past week, so keep him very much in your thoughts and prayers. Hope that he has a speedy recovery, and also uh, Supervisor Cundiff is under the weather today, so keep him and his family as well, and I know there's a lot of sickness going around, but we do appreciate each of you for coming out today and taking a part in the county business. And we'll go ahead and get started. Our first uh, order of business will all stand, and Supervisor Smith will have our invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Supervisor Ronald Mitchell. If you bow your heads, dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in this time of celebration for the birth of your son, Lord, with joy and hope for our future. We hope that you will guide us and lead us through the holiday season in a humbling way uh, with joy, good health, and Lord, that we would come to you um, as we need to over the holiday season for comfort and peace. Lord, we pray for those that are without loved ones that they've lost this past year and that you would give them peace in their heart and the ability to worship through the season as you would have us do. Lord, I pray for this board. I pray that as we strive to work for the citizens of Franklin County, that you grant us wisdom and that you grant us perseverance to do the very best job we can for this beautiful county and all of the people in it. Lord, we, we pray for your blessing over the holiday season, and we pray for your blessings today. And we pray for each of the households represented here today. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, first item is the approval of the agenda. Before we do, do any board members have any additional additions, amendments, or deletions to the agenda? Seeing none, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I will. Do we have a second? Second. Have a motion and a second to approve the agenda as presented. All in favor, let me know by saying aye. Aye. Same side. Nay. Passed approved unanimously. Thank you. Okay, uh, next on the agenda, we want to recognize our Homestead Creamery. Uh, I have to say that uh, this time of year, the Homestead Creamery has a, a warm spot in my heart because uh, I love eggnog. <laughs> and they have the best anywhere around. And uh, I just, at this time, I want to recognize their co founder, Mr. Donnie Montgomery. Their president, Mr. Walt Frazier, and their controller, Mr. Jesse Novak. Uh, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for being here. Also, I have a statement that I wanted to read <clears throat> that was given to me earlier. It says, two weeks ago, Chairman Thompson represented the board at an event at Homestead Creamery celebrating the 10th anniversary of the first AFID grant award in Virginia. For those who do not know, AFID stands for Agriculture and Forestry Industries Development and is the state grant that helps those in our agriculture and timber industries. It is a program that helps those businesses in the ag sector that often do not qualify for other state assistance. Since then, Franklin County has also received a planning grant and an infrastructure grant and other for other local businesses, making us the first locality in Virginia to utilize three AFID programs. Chairman Thompson also said something at the ceremony a couple of weeks ago that's important and bears repeating. Agriculture is Franklin County's largest industry, and it's a huge piece of our past, our present, and our future. And, and I, I, to echo that, I have to say that we as a board, and I know in past and and I feel confident with saying that also in the future this board will always support our agricultural industry uh, it's our roots people and we're not we don't want to get away from from our roots it's our foundation also I'll get back to my statement uh, 
This, these programs, the AFI grant, can assist uh, the farming industry and timber industry, and it's our obligation to do so as a Board of Supervisors to support these industries. The reason we celebrate the AFID an anniversary at Homestead Creamery is because the Creamery was the uh, recipient of the first ever AFID grant in the state of Virginia back in December of 2012. Along with the county support, it helped Homestead successfully expand its operations to meet the growing demand they saw coming for their sensational products. The investment made by Homestead uh, increased the county's tax base and put up 20 additional people to work. Great job. Homestead Creamery continues to see growing demand and opportunities. They epitomize the kind of business we want to see in our community. Good to their employees, strong community partners, and unmatched ambassador for Franklin County. I'm so proud that we're able to take just a few minutes today to recognize and thank them for all they do for our community. Now I'd like to read and present this proclamation to Homestead Creamery. But before I do, I want to recognize some special guests in the audience today. And as I did just a few minutes ago, I would like for uh, Donnie Montgomery, Walt Frazier, and Jesse Novak, if you could meet me up front, please. Okay, let me see here. All right. Whereas agriculture is Virginia and Franklin County's largest private industry, and whereas the governor's agriculture and forestry in industries development funds consist of fac facility planning and infrastructure grants to incentivize and enhance the viability of agriculture and forestry related businesses and localities to grow markets and ensure the stability of these industries and whereas the governor's agriculture and forestry industries development fund has supported agriculture and forestry based economic developments in 101 cities towns and counties across the commonwealth and demonstrates a shared commitment to the success of virginia's farms and forest lands and whereas the first governor's agriculture and forestry industries development funds facilities grant was awarded to Franklin County and Homestead Creamery on December 17th, 2022. Let me ask a question. Is uh, that, is that a misprint? That is a misprint. Okay. It should be 2012. I okay. Apologize. That was December the 17th, 2012. And we'll, we'll get that corrected. And whereas the Homestead Creamery, with support and the Governor's Agriculture and Forestry Industries Development Fund grant, has successfully expanded its operations, creating 20 new jobs, increased the purchase of Virginia-grown products from area farmers, and increased the county's tax base, and whereas Homestead Creamery continues to serve as an exemplary employer, a leading corporate citizen in our community, and an unmatched ambassador for of Franklin County brand, whereas it is most appropriate that we recognize and express our gratitude for the forethought and commitment made by Homestead Creamery in Franklin County. Now, therefore, we, the Franklin County Board of Supervisors, do hereby recognize Homestead Creamery in honor of its 10th anniversary as Virginia's first agriculture and forestry industries development grant recipient in which the company continues success in the years to come. proud of Homestead Creamery and the hard work and dedication that these men have shown and put forth in supporting our community. It's not just the Burnt Chimney area, but all of Franklin County. And I have to say, a friend of mine lives in Knoxville, Tennessee, and he sent me an email the other day. He sent me a picture that uh, his Kroger's that uh, has, 
he said they were running low on Homestead Creamery ice cream and milk, but uh, they carry it. And, and he's, he's proud to say he's from Franklin County and he knows where that came from. Thank you all. Mr. Chairman, while you're making your way up, um, I would comment that Mr. Montgomery uh, is graciously serving on our agricultural board um, that we've newly seated, uh, and very grateful for your participation, Donnie, and, uh, and look forward to you bringing all your expertise and experience to the table with ice cream, <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> And at this time, we are going to take a, a short break to give all the other board members a chance to, to just come and just relay to you our sincerest appreciation for all the hard work you do for us. And I'm sure there's some uh, citizens here in, in our gallery that would also like to share that same sentiment. So we'll take about a uh, eight or ten minute break to get we'll call the meeting back to order this time. Again, thank you again for our visitors from Homestead Creamery. If any of you haven't had an opportunity this season, their eggnog's great. Get out there and get you some. Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. I'd like to remind everyone if you've had any questions uh, concerning the consent agenda, uh, I hope you've had an opportunity to check with staff with any of these concerns. Uh, anyone have any, any comments or Anything about the consent agenda as presented? Okay, seeing none, do I have a motion that we approve the consent agenda? I will, Mr. Chairman. Second. Um, okay, I have a motion and a second that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Any discussion before we take a vote? Okay, all in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented, let it be known by saying aye. 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 All, uh, all opposed, same sign. Let it be known that it was unanimous. Okay. Moving right along. Hi, uh, Daniels. Good to see you today, Mr. Daniels. Yes, sir, Vice Chairman and members of the board, good to be with you. Um, I'll say the gentleman from Homestead left. I was going to say that. Uh, we too enjoy homestead in our home. In fact, I've got a, I hate to admit, I've got a quart bottle. I think I owe them back. So, uh, <laughs> and Kroger has the, the sign that they want them back. So <laughs> I'll work on getting that back to them. I've um, got a few quick highlights uh, on the report, two page report today, and then, and then take any questions, comments that you may have. So um, the notes I wanted to make uh, on 220, um, repairing a drop inlet near Worch Road. I actually commented that was completed last month because it was completed between the time the report was printed and, and when I came to the board. Um, so we're just highlighting that that's done. Uh, a similar type of repair, which is the last bullet of a drop inlet near Taylor's Road. Uh, we were doing some repair on the aprons and those things get washed out around the top and what have you. So it's, it's minor, but it's a big deal when it comes to drainage. Uh, we also completed the next to last bullet, a pipe replacement on 220 near Henry Road, which was a, uh, a bore and jack, which is good because it doesn't impact traffic. It's, it's quite expensive, but uh, it, uh, it saves our major roads from, from significant uh, problems. So those three are complete. Um, we don't have it on here, but, but our main objective and stance right now is winter weather. We started today doing some brine application on our major highways, primaries, and some, some major secondaries, and we'll, we'll wrap that up tomorrow. Um, and then we will have our areas fully staffed Wednesday night, Thursday morning, and stay until it's over, until the roads are clear, which I hope is Friday night, Saturday, before Sunday. So we'll see. Um, on page two, uh, the only note I, I had was a roundabout on, at 834 and uh, uh, 670 Brooks Mill and Burnt Chimney, where the final surface has been placed. The pavement marking is uh, due to go in tomorrow, which we believe will have the weather for that. Uh, there's some other work to be completed. Um, but it is, it's, it's getting very close to final completion. Uh, even after, because it's completed in January or, or winter, we're going to have to go back in the spring and summer, do some cleanup, overseeding because the vegetation 
it's, it's not conducive right now to get good vegetation. So you'll see work out there even in the summer, but the, the project will be complete. And with that, uh, Vice Chairman, that's all I had for today. All right. Anyone have any questions or comments from Mr. Daniels? I had one of my constituents ask me about um, on Atkins Road, Route 600. Apparently, the bottom part of it was closed off to public travel, and gates have already been put up to block from going down there. And there was an agreement that there was supposed to be a turnaround put in, and that has not been done. It makes it difficult on state vehicles and stuff when they get down there and have to turn around. And I, their question, they thought maybe the, that person was responsible for putting it in, but they weren't sure. We abandoned that right away, didn't we? Yeah. We did. yeah. Um, so, Mr. Mitchell, yeah, I, I, I don't know all the, the intricate details on it, but we did abandon the section of road in concurrence with the landowner. Were they supposed to put it in? Talk about doing that. I'll follow up. We'll follow up, connect with the landowner, and uh, we'll, we'll get you an answer back. Because no doubt a dead end road needs somewhere to turn around. Yes, sir. Anyone else have anything? Thank you, Todd, and tell you, you and your staff, have a Merry Christmas and hope that hope everyone is safe. If we have that winter weather this weekend. We pray for their safety. Yes, sir. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Okay, uh, Brian Carter, Director of Finance and Human Services. Share some good news to us. Well, sir, we'll see how good the news is. <laughs> uh, go up here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair, and so members of the board. So, uh, for our finance report, these are numbers through November 30th. So, our five months out of the fiscal year that we'd be expecting. It's about 41.6 percent of the year. So. Percentage-wise, that's what we would expect to see as we look at this shot of our general fund. And so revenue-wise, uh, for the ones that are monthly, we are looking uh, looking very well ahead of budget where we would want to be. Uh, property taxes, of course, we're looking at those. Those are still coming in, or at least were as of November 30th when we ran uh, this report. So we'll have a more complete picture update at your January meeting through December and, uh, and give you an idea. We'll talk a little bit more about that in some of the detail. On the expenditure side, uh, we are, with the exception of the couple of areas that we know always trend a little ahead because of all the upfront payments for insurance and contracts that we pay, are still looking below that 41.6% mark that we would expect to see. So to graphically show the revenues, you can see through October, you can see that blue line is the current year that's down. That is because of twice a year real estate tax collection. So, and you're going to see that continually throughout this year when we compare to prior year until we get to that May to June window, you might start to see a little bit of a variation. Break it down a little bit more, that's where you see it is in the property taxes. And so that gap between the yellow bar, which is the current year, and the green line, which is the prior year, is just the difference in half of real estate for where we normally collected all of it at this time of year. For other local taxes, we are up uh, a little over eight hundred thousand dollars, and so uh, and that's that's your sales taxes, your meals, those type things. Go a little more detail on those. And revenue from the, the Commonwealth is, is pretty much consistent with where we would expect it to be. So breaking down a little bit more on your other local taxes, so local sales tax, you can see it's still trending well. Uh, it's at 11% increase year over year. Uh, that's about $319,000. From a budgetary perspective, you can see we're at almost 50% of the budget, so we're ahead instead of the 41.6 where you'd want to be. So, And, of course, this is the two-month lag. So for November, our collections, that would be for September sales. And so we'll keep up with that because, as you notice, in February you see the spike. Well, that's December sales, so we'll, we'll keep up with that. For meals tax... We're still trending well. Uh, I will note that we are dropping a little bit when we look at year over year. Last month we were at 8.1% increase. We've dropped to 6.7%. So we're keeping an eye on that. I certainly know if with the inflationary factors, not unanticipated, but we definitely want to keep a growth trend there. So I think you're starting to see probably some people pull back and it may be they're eating out less to pay for Christmas. And so we might see that sales tax bump. So uh, not a concern at any point, still trending above, but it, it has started to uh, normalize and, and, and reduce that growth trend. 
We're seeing the same thing with transient occupancy tax. <clears throat> and so through November, we have about a $61,500 increase. That's about 31.5%, but it was 33.7% last month. And so you can see as that line, as we compare the two uh, in November, it's a little ahead of where we were, it's a little behind last month. So it is starting to, to uh, come a little closer to where we'd anticipate. Uh, it's not a significant driver in our budget, as you can tell, uh, from a few hundred thousand dollars, but it is a very important indicator of discretionary spending in the economy when you look at these three taxes. So for expenditures, you can see uh, trending-wise, November is up, but October was down when we compare to last year. So overall, we're about in the same spot we would anticipate to be. A lot of that tends to be timing. Sometimes it's the timing of our weekly check runs and things of that nature as to where it gets captured. So nothing in particular that is of concern. And so this breaks down the categories a little bit. We would expect a slight increase in expenses just overall. Uh, that is typical. The vast majority of our budget is personnel uh, as our staff that deliver services to the citizens of the county. And so we do see that little bit of uptick on most of these expenditure categories. Um, you actually see health and welfare down a little bit. I want to break that down for you. That's mostly contributed to CSA. And really for that, that is just an accounting timing. Uh, that was us really getting prior expenses corrected earlier than we did in previous years. Overall, uh, expenses are, aren't, aren't um, ballooning. They are okay trend-wise. They're probably more even where we would expect this point compared to last year. So don't don't get too excited when you see that. CSA is not trending that well. It's it's about even with what we'd expect. So uh, still managing that with what we can uh, what we can. So on fund balances, so we do have the the audited number now and that presentation uh, we will plan for that at your January meeting of the final audited results. There was a scheduling conflict with our auditors for today. They could not be here, so we'll just push that to the January meeting. But this number is from the draft report, uh, the audit report. So unassigned fund balance for the general fund is $37.9 million as of June 30th, the end of our fiscal year. So there are a couple of things that were approved at the last board meeting. So the $1,725,000 of those budget commitments, we restored those. We did, uh, we did also have an additional uh, one point, almost $1.5 in rollover approvals. And, so, um, and then the $2.3 million, we're still holding that placeholder for the school system as we continue to work through year end. Certainly they will have a request for that uh, in the coming months. Our, our new policy minimum of 20% uh, of general fund revenues to hold back as our unassigned was uh, just under $25.6 million. So that leaves us about $6.8 million above our policy required minimum at this point. So, And then below that, with the action that you took on those budget commitments, we do now have uh, the million dollars restored to the budget stabilization reserve, and we also have our capital reserve at almost $1.2 million. That, by the way, that capital reserve does not account for the hundred and fifty so thousand that was just approved. So now it's just over a million dollars. Make that clarification. <laughs> so economic update: uh, we are seeing uh, month over month, or year over year, I guess we should say, uh, increase again in, in inflation. CPI, Consumer Pricing Index, it was seven point one percent compared to November of last year, as far as an increase in normal goods and services. So still seeing the Federal Reserve hike the, um, the federal funds rate, which is the borrowing rate between banks. And so that's kind of what indicates what we as consumers pay for our loans. And so, it's, so they increased the rate again about 0.5%. That was less. They had four or five months of 0.75% increases. And so it, it's still anticipated that you will see increased hikes for probably at least till the middle of next calendar year, depending on how inflation and the market responds. And so that does, though, push borrowing costs at the highest level since 2007. There's a lot of forecasts, and uh, I think the, uh, the consensus is nobody knows. If you look at some are predicting ne in next calendar year 2023 a mild recession, some are predicting no recession. Some are predicting a very serious recession. Uh, and so we'll see who, who is right. But um, I think the obviously the goal of the Federal Reserve is to manage inflation. 
And so as they increase these rates, the goal is to, if there is a recession, that it is very mild and short-lived. The, but hopefully through that, those items, we see a little bit of decrease in our capital inflation as well as our labor costs because those items are on a sustainable path right now. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Anyone have any questions mm -hmm. for Brian? No. I just don't see any. Okay. Ho, 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 Brian. Thank you. <laughs> Steve, ready? Okay. We're going to deviate away from our agenda a little bit. The supervisor uh, Ronald Mitchell had to step out, and there's a couple items that he wants to be uh, with us on, and uh, and we are a little running a little bit ahead of schedule, so we're going to jump down, and I'm going to ask for Steve Sandy, Assistant County Administrator, if he will come, and uh, we'll discuss possible code amendments relating to chapter 25 of our zoning and regarding to the utility uh, solar scale discussion and so attachment number nine in your booklets all right thank you mr chairman and lisa cooper's here as well in case uh, in case i need some assistance here but yeah, this, this item was something we talked about last month that uh, the board asked uh, for staff to bring back some, some recommendations relative to utility scale solar. Um, so just a little bit of background, um, the board about two years ago really started the discussion uh, about developing the zoning ordinance relative to utility scale solar. And so at that time, the board and the planning commission began the process to uh, develop some, some language and some amendments. And then ultimately in July of last year, or July of this year, 2022, uh, the board did adopt uh, zoning regulations for utility scale solar as well as comprehensive plan amendments uh, related to that. And then just last month, the, the board did approve its first siting agreement for utility scale solar. It was about a 150 acre project area, uh, about 12 megawatt facility in the non-zoned area on Route 40 west of Rocky Mount. And then as I said, uh, kind of subsequent to that meeting and those uh, discussions, the, the board expressed the desire to address some additional setback requirements as well as uh, cumulative acreage for utility scale solar, which would require us to go back and amend uh, that ordinance that was adopted in July. So um, I'll take those two proposed amendments uh, separately. And so the first one is a cumulative acreage cap. Um, and so, uh, one of the ideas is to develop a cumulative uh, developed acreage not to exceed in the number I have here that I threw in here was 1,500 acres for all solar facilities in the county. Um, and this um, cap w was actually part of uh, some of the early discussions of the zoning ordinance uh, revisions, and it was really based on <coughs> the Rockingham County, a, a model that they developed. And really what it, what it results in is, is looking at the whole state of Virginia, the uh, intended uh, amount of solar that uh, the state of Virginia wanted to have in its energy plan and really dividing that up across all the counties is, is a simplistic way of kind of saying that. And that's how Rockingham came up with their number. They're a larger county. I think their number was 1,800 if I remember correctly. Um, and so we really just kind of followed that model and that rationale. So it's really based on the acreage of the county um, and kind of that, that overall goal for uh, solar development uh, in the state of Virginia. No other real magic to that number, uh, just we thought that was an easy mathematical way to kind of figure out uh, a cumulative cap. Uh, that cumulative cap really, uh, the way Rockingham does theirs, it, it, we can do it any way we want, but the way they do theirs is it's really based on the amount of acreage that has solar on it. So as an example, the, the siting agreement we had was 150 acre site, but only 40 to 50 acres of that was solar, um, panels and, and buildings and other things. 
And so the way they interpret it is that they take that, let's say 50 acre number, that's what goes toward the cumulative number, not the 150. Uh, we could set it up either way. We could base it on total project area or uh, those areas with above ground solar infrastructure uh, is, is probably the way we would recommend it. And they would just have to um, have a survey and provide that number to us as part of that process. And then we would just keep that cumulative account uh, of that acreage. And so the one, um, one item that the board did ask staff to, to look at and come back with a proposed amendment was this cumulative acreage. And, and so that's the recommendation we would make is that 1500. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, this is in the zoning ordinance. Zoning ordinance only applies to those areas of the county that have zoning. And so in my opinion, and I'll look to, to Mr. Gwynn maybe to confirm or, or otherwise, but anything that's in the zoning ordinance as far as an overall cap would likely only apply to those areas that are affected by the zoning ordinance. Um, I think the other way to get at an overall county cap would probably be go back to your comprehensive plan and put a policy in there that says no more than X number of acres uh, of solar throughout the entire county. Does that make sense? Does May I, Mr. Vice Absolutely. Chair? Mr. Sandy, just with respect to, to this topic, the executive summary uh, under the discussion for number one states, as you just stated, uh, that we're dealing within the zoned areas. Uh, when I look at your slide, the slide says for all solar facilities in the county. So, um, I am very interested in understanding the distinction that we are going to be recommended to make between um, zoned and unzoned areas with respect to counting those unzoned projects in the cumulative acreage cap. Um, Mr. Gwynn, do you have any guidance on that for us? I'm not sure I understood your question. Is there anything from a legal perspective with the non-zoned areas that would not allow us to count that acreage in a cap under our zoning ordinance because it's non-zoned? Well, if you're doing it under the zoning ordinance, I think it has to be in the zoned areas that you count it in. But I think that I don't know that necessarily we have to do it under the zoning ordinance. We could. We could put it elsewhere and then you would you certainly would get past the argument of whether or not it would apply in the zone area is it apply countywide where else would we put it uh, the comprehensive plan you could put it the comprehensive plan is a good place for it but it's not going to be some it's not necessarily enforceable in a, in a mm -hmm. comprehensive plan right. that's a, a a plan sort of a hope type thing I mean, you could just create another chapter and put it in it. Okay. I, I just wanted to raise that as a point of clarification. I think the county has the authority to do it. Okay. Um, it's been done in counties that are fully zoned. Okay. Uh, so therefore, they've done it in their zoning ordinance. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's the reason it's in the zoning ordinance is because it covers the whole county. On the other hand, if you've got the authority to do it, I mean, you got the authority. It doesn't have to be in the zoning part of it. Okay, thank you. And you wouldn't have that argument. Uh, to that point, I think, you know, we, we do have an erosion sediment control stormwater section of the code that does apply countywide. Potentially, yep. we could explore putting something in that section. Is that if I'm following your, right. your thought process? Right. I would support the inclusion of the non-zone for the cap um, because I, I remain highly concerned about our agricultural land um, <clears throat> and this cap starts to address limiting that exposure to some degree over time um, and for that reason um, if we could include the non-zoned acreage um, I think that I would be comfortable supporting that for that reason I have to say I agree with Ms. Smith on that because a large uh, portion of our agricultural land is located in our unzoned areas. I mean, the entire Blue Ridge District that I represent is completely unzoned. A portion of the Blackwater and a portion of Snow Creek 
are unzoned as well. And uh, my biggest concern with limiting the zoned areas and not including the rest of the county is if we put a limit there that these solar uh, companies will uh, target more aggressively our unzoned areas for development of these projects because that's a way of getting around our limit that the county has set. I think to be reasonable and fair for me and you know my stance on zoning, uh, you know, I represent the Blue Ridge District where zoning ha is not uh, a desired topic, but uh, I don't want to see the Blue Ridge District overrun by solar panels either. And I would, I, I think I, I would support putting that uh, limitation in a different category so that it would be uh, a protection for the entire county and not just the zoned areas. I think w what I would recommend then is we would, we would put it in the zoning ordinance, but we would also put it in, uh, I think it's chapter seven, okay. erosion, sediment control and stormwater. Uh, that way, before any of those plans were approved, they would make sure it's not exceeding that cap. And then I think just as a, as a matter of policy, I think it makes sense to put it in the comprehensive plan as well. And if that's the board's direction, we could look at all three of those uh, okay. avenues for putting that cap in. I guess my question would be, is the 1,500 acres a, a, a reasonable number? Is that the number you want us to go with? And that's the number we use countywide, not just zoned area, but, but, but countywide? I think so. And one reason I see it is because, I mean, prime example, the area that, that we just discussed last month was a total of 140, 150 acres, but only about 45 acres of it was actually covered with solar panels. And uh, so, you know, 100, you know, 1,500 acres, it's a lot of solar panels. That several of those projects could, yes. could fit within that acreage, yes, sir. Okay. Well, that's what we'll, we'll move. I think uh, at the end, I'll get to some of that um, direction we need to give to, to staff and the Planning Commission as far as next steps, but I'll kind of summarize that at the end. But that's Chapter 7, you say, Mr. Sandy? I, I think, Lisa, is that Chapter 7, it's ENS? Chapter seven. ENS and Thank Stormwater you. Chapter? Um, typically, I don't, I don't know if amendments to that chapter typically go through the Planning Commission, but we can certainly do that. Obviously, the zoning ordinance, um, we would seek a recommendation from the, the Planning Commission, but that, I think, would be the board's pleasure if you want them to hold a public hearing on Chapter 7 as well. Uh, but again, I, we'll kind of summarize that at the end as far as the, the next steps. The, the other item that, that was referenced that the board had interest in uh, inserting into the ordinance was the uh, setback of 300 feet um, from any uh, above ground solar infrastructure to any adjacent offsite residential structure. Um, so in the, in the zoned areas, uh, the projects would in, in A1 are gonna require a special use permit. And so this would be the minimum. Uh, you know, the board through the conditions and through the circumstances of that particular site could actually make that setback larger, but this would be the kind of the minimum setback would be the 300 if this was approved. Uh, again, would only apply to the zoned areas because uh, this would be the zoning ordinance and, and would only apply there. And then I just noted that the first approved siting agreement that we had did have this provision in it. Uh, they were willing to uh, accept that provision and so for those non-zoned areas, as we go through our siting agreements, kind of our first step is always going to be, hey, are you willing to comply with all the standards of the zoning ordinance, even though you're in the non-zoned area? And so this would be one of those items that we would still ask them to kind of consider, I think, in those non-zoned areas. So that was the second item and really the only two items that, that I recall uh, the board specifically mentioning, you know, wanting to add into the Mr. Sandy, uh, this 300-foot setback from uh, off-site residential structures, uh, is that something that has to be in the zoning ordinance, or is that something similar to the 1,500-acre limit? Is that something, could we put that in, a, in Chapter 7 as well to c also cover the unzoned parts of Franklin County? Again, I might have to defer to Mr. Gwynn on that. I, I think... If we're going to add several things, then maybe we'd go into Chapter 7 to, to look at adding some 
criteria for solar, um, but um, I'm not not sure what kind of legal options we have there for, for an area that's not subject to the zoning ordinance. I don't know. I, I was, my question was, if we include the 1,500 foot limit, I mean 1,500 acre limit into Chapter 7, could we do the 300 foot setback in Chapter 7 as well? I mean, right now we're talking about putting in the zoning ordinance. Could we include that in Chapter 7 to also protect the unzoned sections of Franklin County as well as the zoned areas? I'd have to go back and study what authority the state gives us under ENS. Okay. That might be a little bit further than we want to go. Okay. Probably is, but yeah. I mean, if we can find a way to do it, we will, but yeah. I don't count on it. Yeah, we're still better off if we can get a, a good solid siting agreement. Right, yeah, okay. The other option would be maybe chapter five under building uh, regulations. We do have a setback there of, um, I think it's 35 feet for, for structures in the non-zoned area. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, I was thinking about that for the uh, solar as well, and just happened to be glancing through it. Most of it is the building code, the right. state building code. We would have, it would be supplemental. Okay. We we can explore whether or not we could also add that into Chapter Five or Chapter Seven of the County Code. Okay. If we if we have that legal authority. Um, this was just mentioned earlier as, as a possible amendment to the comprehensive plan uh, to to add to strategy 36.0 a uh, that that cumulative acreage requirement and so from what we discussed earlier sound like that would be the board's desire to add go ahead and add that as one of our policies as well um, so we'll, we'll move forward if it's to the board's uh, agreement we'll move forward with with that piece as well so kind of next steps is the determine the amendment language for the zoning amendments. So uh, from our discussion, I think uh, we would be looking at that 1500 cumulative acreage cap for the uh, above ground solar features um, area of the of a project, as well as that 300 foot uh, setback to offsite residential structures. Um, also determined, I think we have determined that you want to amend the comprehensive plan as well to include that 1500 uh, acre cumulative acreage. And with that, um, I think the action item we would need today is just for staff, uh, for the board to refer those proposed amendments um, to the planning commission for public hearing. And so I think they could take it up as soon as January if, if you made that for referral today with um, within a public hearing before this board in February for, for that item. Um, the caveat I'll put in there maybe is just some legal research on the chapter five and chapter seven as far as what we can put in there. But I think those items, I, I, I don't think those items would need to necessarily go through the planning commission. I think that could just be maybe added to your February public hearing uh, for those other county code sections. But I'll, I'll work with the county attorney's office on those items, but I think we can start moving forward on the, the zoning ordinance and comprehensive plan if that's the board's desire. All right. Anyone else have any questions for Mr. Sandy? So just to clarify, Steve, you don't want any action by this board to include language about amending Chapter 7? I think probably a good thing to do would be for staff to work with legal counsel to, to see, you know, how we can make those amendments in Chapter 5 and Chapter 7. Okay. I guess what we need to Regarding setbacks and cumulative acreage. We need to vote on whether or not to have a public hearing to get this moving forward. Correct. For us to go ahead and schedule the zoning ordinance and comp plan amendments. Um, if, if we find that we can do uh, amendments to 5 and 7, I think we can come back to you in January. Um, and, and likely schedule those for February, and that way you'd have all the amendments before you in February. All right. What's your pleasure? Uh, if uh, no other supervisors have inquiries, I'm prepared to offer a motion, Mr. Vice Chair. Go ahead. Um, I would make a motion to seek amendments to Chapter 25 and um, also a, a comp plan amendment. Um, to add a 1,500 acre cumulative acreage requirement for utility solar facilities 
and add an additional setback requirement for above ground solar infrastructure to be <clears throat> excuse me, located no less than 300 feet from any off-site residential structure. I move that these proposed amendments be referred to the Planning Commission and staff to schedule public hearings for consideration and these amendments by the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors at the Jan January 2023 and February 2023 meetings, respectively. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, motion and second. Uh, all in any discussion before we take a final vote? All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed, same sign. Let it be known that there were none opposed. Thank you, Mr. Sandy. Thank you. All right, moving right along, Sheriff Overton. Take your time. We, we're two minutes ahead. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chairman, board members, Mr. Whitlow, Mr. Gwynn, and Madam Kirk, Clerk, thank you all. Merry Christmas to each of you. I thank you for allowing me to be here today to make two presentations to you but before i do that i did want to give you a little bit of an update back in november i had the privilege of being in st louis missouri for the Kaleo, who are the national accreditation uh, that we've talked quite a bit about and i'm um, pleased to announce today to you that uh, we were certified as a nationally accredited organization back in november we're planning a much formal uh, presentation to occur in March, and you will be invited to attend that and celebrate with us in that effort. The other thing I want to bring to your attention is sometimes I do talk to you individually about concerns from your constituents and anything really that relates to county government, and I'm glad we have an open uh, uh, line to do that. But I want to let you know back in November, we had two incidents of burglary and larceny at our scale center, our scale building at the land field. Uh, and I'm uh, pleased to tell you today that uh, we did make an arrest on that as of yesterday. And I say that because um, due to the circumstances of a lot of those type crimes that we have and how much time is in between the time it's reported to us, you know, we, a lot of times, depending upon the physical evidence, we start at a ground zero. So there were significant hours put into this, but I'm, I'm very pleased to announce that we did make an arrest on that. The reason I'm here with you today is I've got two uh, items that I'd like to speak to you about. The first one is I've been very encouraged as um, we have, you all have continued to move on in your discussion about recruitment and retention. I know you all have had two um, uh, past uh, work sessions where you got together and discussed that to an even a greater depth, and I'm very encouraged about that. Um, during some of those discussions, I think you've been made aware that as we moved through the uh, process of the pay study and then the implementation of the pay plan, I cannot say enough, and I've said it once before, but again, for county staff and how hard they work through that. And again, for your due diligence to make a major uh, approving that uh, pay plan to be implemented, which we were part of. But during those discussions, and I'm sure you've discussed in these two work sessions, we knew there were still going to be areas of concern, tweaking that needed to be concerned uh, to dealt with. And one thing in particular was an item that we were really uh, uh, discussing with uh, county staff was, what do we do with those employees who have time with other agencies but have been hired here and have made a major impact um, and really bring substantial amount of years of service and skill sets to what they were hired to do. Um, at that time, when the pay plan was approved, there was not any accommodations made uh, for time of service elsewhere. And I understood it. I mean, that you know, there was significant more funding that would be, need to be made to do that. Can't speak for other county departments, but in our department in particular, we've lost one individual primarily for that reason they left us because they went to another agency that was going to give them credit for years of service they had before they came to us and also for the years of service they had worked for us i have a second employee i just recently found about that has gone through a second interview phase with another agency and that is another concern he had he worked previously for another agency before coming to work with us 
and was giving no credit, and this agency was going to give him that credit. Fortunately, the state, and we talked about this for a couple months, I, I know I let several of you know about it, but certainly as these funds came in and we were ending one budget cycle, moving into another budget cycle, rollover funds, and all of those things were part of uh, finance and what they were working through, we understand here just of recent that the, the final total is uh, that the state compensation board was going to con uh, in more funding than they had previously done, but it was an additional $185,000 that they were sending, which is reoccurring funds. This is not one-time fund. It's salary money that will be going toward uh, the salaries for sheriff's office employees. And as we've met with Mr. Cardi and discussed that, I'm here today to make a proposal that the board allow us to use those funds to make the adjustments necessary. It's about 20 people in our organization who bring service of duty from another agency to ours. As, a, as that ongoing retention effort that we're trying to make sure we do to keep good people, uh, I'm asking you to uh, allocate or let us use that 185,000 moving forward to address those issues. These individuals would not be getting any more than what was um, approved through the pay plan as far as percentages, uh, not any, any greater percentages than the county initially approved there, but it certainly would help and give them that extra funding for years of service, and maybe not all of it, but as much of it as we can cover within that uh, funding. So that is my proposal on the one proposal I have is for you to approve that 185,000 for us to continue to work on the retention end of keeping members of our organization and keeping them working here in the county. All right, Sheriff, one thing that, and I spoke with you about it just the other day, and I concur completely, you know, when you're able to have the good fortune to with, for lack of better terms, steal an employee from somewhere else. The last thing you want is somebody to steal them from you because we can't recognize that service. And, and I fully understand and I support this program on that basis. Also, if you have to go out and hire a new employee, our start and pay for a road deputy now is 45000 and some change. Correct. We both know and all of us know from day one that you hire him, if you hire someone the 1st of January, by the time you get him through the academy, get him through his FTO training and everything, it's bare minimum 1st of January of next year before you get any type of production out of that officer. So we're investing 45 plus thousand dollars, and that's not counting the training, the fuel and time it takes to, you know, send him to the academy, the, you know, equipment, all that. You know, it's not, not counting any of that. Uh, you know, we're investing a pretty hefty investment in these people just to get started and if we have an opportunity to bring someone in from from another agency that that is already certified already trained and bring some some years of experience you know that that's just our good good luck <laughs> and I, you know I, it it bothers me when we lose people because we we're not in position to recognize that those years of service so that's where I'm at on it. I, I, I told you I, 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 I back you 100 percent on that and, and knowing that you know this is an opportunity that we see this money coming from the comp board and it is recurring money. So you know we're able to hopefully retain some of these people and not put an extra burden on our local taxpayers here. So Very nice. that's where I'm at on it. Anyone else like to weigh in? I just have a question, if I may, sure. Mr. Vice Chair. Yeah. Um, Sheriff, I, just to clarify, this money is going to be recurring through the state comp board? That is correct, yes, ma'am. This is monies that um, were in addition to the 5% that the state gave, um, monies that uh, where the salary was increased from the state, and then there was a comp uh, compression funding that was in that as well that the state gave to all local sheriff's offices. And so it's restricted in terms of just where you're going to be permitted to use it. Would that be correct? It is It is salary funding, yes. Okay, okay. And is it your intention to use that on an ongoing basis for this purpose? 
It is, and a great question, and thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, another problem, not a problem, but this certainly will help us when, when you do receive funding of this nature, as we are trying to fill the positions that uh, we are, especially for the SROs that we moved into our school system, um, the more folks that we can get that are already certified, it certainly helps us tremendously. I've got about uh, nine that are getting ready to start the academy in January. But we do have, and we've been very fortunate to have two candidates that we just hired who are certified SROs from other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. But some of this funding will allow us to be able to compensate them to get them to a, a, a negotiable hiring rate from where they currently are to come here with us. Okay, thank you. So we're very thankful we got this money at this time and to be able to do that as well. Thank you. Sheriff, I'm pretty new at this, so you're going to have to excuse me if, yes. if, um, if what I say is correct. And this might be a better question for Mr. Carter. So with this coming from the comp board, if we do, which, and I don't quite understand how that works, why the county has to vote on what you guys are receiving from the comp board or if that's tied into the county pay plan. But if we vote for you not to, to keep this money, what happens to it then? To be quite honest with you, I, I'm assuming the, the county could absorb that money into their budget and uh, they could apply it to, the, the only way they could utilize the money, I believe, is to apply it to the $2 million, if I'm correct, I'll let Mr., but to apply it to the funding that you are, have already voted in the initial pay plan that we um, agreed to enter in. Sure, you share. The, uh, so, yes, sir, uh, Mr. Mitchell. So the compensation board funding in this particular instance is state funding for the sheriff's office. All compensation board funding is reimbursement based. So essentially if, uh, well, first question was the reason why the board needs to approve it is the county needs to appropriate that funding. So unless the board approves and appropriates that, we can't spend it. So that's, that's the action item for the board. If the board chooses not to do so, essentially compensation board funding is reimbursement based. It just means that the sheriff's office will not make those adjustments that the sheriff just mentioned. So that 185,000 just won't be able to be used anywhere else in the county? Correct, it would have to be specific for the sheriff's office and, and specifically compensation board funding pays for compensation and fringe benefits for that particular office. In this case, the sheriff's office. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. And sheriff, I also, you know, I just, a lot of the departments and a lot, everybody else is dealing with the same things the sheriff's office is and each department deals with these things. I mean, I know we have constitutional offices in the county and I mean, some people have moved from them and moved to other county jobs and I feel that those people haven't had the means to, to do what we're talking about doing here, to have that amount of money to try and keep, retain, or pay people more for their experience. And I, I just want to be equal to all departments and not, not giving the sheriff's office an ax and giving the rest of them a butter knife. Right. And I, I kind of get that feeling on this. Yeah, and, and let, if I could address it, Mr. Mitchell, I, I appreciate your opinion on that greatly. And the only answer I can give you is, uh, and you all met with Ren Williams today, I think at the end of the day, and we have seen it over the past two years where this defund police movement went, that the, the infrastructure of any locality and its citizen safety is paramount with law enforcement. And at the end of the day, that is the duty of government is to the safeguard and safety of their citizens. I feel the same. I think uh, other workers in the county deserve immensely for the work they do. But I would mentioned this before, before the board, I do not believe that we should be uh, placed in a position where we are not afforded certain things because of that argument, because simply the fact the service we provide is an integral part of county government and the safety and what government is supposed to do and that's the safety of their citizens and i do think we could be drastically affected as many agencies across this state are due to the fact that the recruitment and retention and keeping law enforcement as is at an all-time low and has never been like this before and once law enforcement and safety becomes a factor 
Um, it, it, it slows economic development, it slows growth, and everything comes to a standstill. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah. <clears throat> I'll just like comment that um, I support both of these items. Um, I guess the uh, to go from 111 to 112 sheriff and just reading through this basically that one time that one full-time position their specific job is to set with people at the hospital mental health understand. yes we would actually be going to martinsville they're going to have a new office setting in martinsville and it would be uh housed there so that's where the uh workers uh the off-duty officer would be assigned yes and then if we have a um, situation where we have a deputy sitting at the hospital, that officer from Martinsville will come up and sit with? If it, if it operate under the, the hours that they're looking at operating, everything would be transported down there and uh, the processing would occur at that facility there. Once that facility does close based upon their hours, and I think they're staggering the hours to include early morning and late in the evening, then that person that is waiting for mental health would be brought back to our hospital, transported back here, and an officer would sit with them here until the facility opened up again. Tell you what, before we get into the CIT position, yes. let's let's go ahead and finish up with the the uh, one hundred eighty-five thousand from the comp board and what we want to do with that as far as allowing the sheriff to pay uh, officers that come over from other agencies. And if I could, Mr. Vice Chairman, I'd like to, uh, I forgot to mention, I would like to, the, in the proposal, that this, if approved, would be retroactive back to the August date when the money became available. Anyone else have any questions for the sheriff? I'm good. Mr. Carter? I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion if you're ready. Okay. No other questions? I'll open the floor for a motion. Okay, I make the motion to approve the request to appropriate and allocate the additional compensation board funding of 185000 received August 1st, 2022 to be used as presented in the summary at the request of the sheriff. Second. We have a motion and a second on the floor. Any discussion? Uh, under discussion, Mr. Vice Chair, I would just ask if we need to uh, add language. It says it was received August 1st. Uh, but the actual re, uh, retroactive piece, do we need to add that as a friendly amendment to the motion? Mm. Or does... To make it retroactive. That is the sheriff, is that what you indicated? That was my request, yes. Well, I'll amend my motion to make it retroactive. Okay, and second with that as well. Second. Okay. Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call vote, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Nick Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Chairman Tatum? Yes. Ch Supervisor Thompson is absent for the vote, and Supervisor Cundiff is also absent for the vote. Okay, Sheriff, if you'd like to lead us into the CIT portion. Yes, sir, Mr. Vice Chairman. Uh, many of you know that uh, through Piedmont Mental Health, as uh, they have uh, folks that are needing of service, of mental health service, and they come to us through an ECO emergency custody order uh, or a TDO temporary detouch, detention order that we uh, provide that security and safety of the well-being uh, at the hospital. They've done this for a period of time of paying off-duty pay. And as the mental health crisis has continued to grow, uh, Piedmont and the behavioral health out of Richmond have continued to, uh, to work in efforts of streamlining and making these uh, uh, being more responsive to the people that are in need of this. So now they've come uh, to the, the Piedmont board has come to us with uh, a proposal and offering a grant funding for uh, Franklin County, Henry County, Martinsville, and Patrick County, uh, funding of $75,000 per locality to hire an individual that would man uh, the uh, center there in Martin, the city of Martinsville for those in uh, impatients that come in looking for services. Um, after studying this and meeting with uh, the members, um, uh, it, it, it's going to be uh, 
not undoable for us, but uh, again, we're, they're working through a process <coughs> that is ongoing, ever-changing, as we are with it. But we do believe uh, it's worth giving this a try to see if this works. And one of our questions was, well, if you become so inundated, or as, Mr., as I was responding to Mr. Mitchell, the hours exceed the center and we have to transport that person back to our facility and someone has to stay with them there, would Piedmont continue to provide off-duty pay for that um, period of time? And they have indicated to us, yes, they would. So having said that, uh, we believe it's uh, worth the effort to go into this venture with them, see how it works. They would add uh, one additional <coughs> person to our staffing from 111 to 112. And, uh, and, and the only thing I can tell you, if this does not work, and uh, after a period of time, six months or a year, some changes need to be made, we would certainly understand and be willing to, through attrition, bring that individual back into our 111 number without coming back to the board and asking to continue that, uh, that particular <coughs> position. And this is an ongoing grant, mm -hmm. a yearly ongoing that would have to certainly be approved, I'm sure, by the board to continue the grant funding for that position of $75,000. Now, that's with benefits. That's not, the, that's not the salary. Well, let me ask you this. At what, if this does work and, and we see that this is a beneficial position and if the grant money goes away, uh, the leftover money from this 185000 we just approved, could that be used to go toward this extra position maybe in the future down the road? <coughs> well, it's, it's possible, but mm -hmm. I think I think at that time, and it's, it's, it's kind of, I think, what Ms. Smith was alluding to, Mr. Uh, Delegate Williams this morning, is uh, Richmond needing to find more ways to fund yes. these mandates, and that is their responsibility for that funding for, for sure. Yeah. Although I, I know you all have seen the recent... Um, coverage through the governor's grant. Uh, a lot of money is being moved into the mental health uh, crisis that we do have, and, and rightfully so. It is in a crisis for us right now. So I think, again, we're continuing to be in uncharted waters. Again, if this is going to work or not for us, I know that um, uh, this may help Henry County and Martinsville. They've got more uh, uh, dealing with more inpatient help than uh, we currently do, although we have quite a few. But uh, time will tell if this process is going to work. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, Ms. Smith. I do. Sheriff, is this $75,000 allocation, is that per locality or for the collective group? Per, like, per locality. It's per locality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was recently on a, on a Zoom call with the commissioner of DBHDS, and uh, I can verify and confirm what you're saying about the governor's um, very strong interest in promotion of mental health services in the Commonwealth. It is a significant priority and they're throwing lots of money at it. Um, and I think, you know, we have talked in this chamber a few times about the TDOs and about how that's taken our officers off the street um, for hours and hours at a time. So I don't have any reason to think that this one not be successful and i think if it's proven successful we could you know potentially model this maybe on more of a local basis versus regional where we have to share services wow. anyone else have any questions for the sheriff okay gentlemen and lady what's your pleasure on this i'll make a motion oh. yeah i okay. apologize earlier i thought it that's okay. Came first. That's so I okay. was confused. But um, if you're ready for a motion, Mr. Chairman, I'll make it. I'm ready. Make sure I'm on the right spot here. Yeah. <clears throat> make a motion to approve the, re the request to accept and appropriate the grant from Piedmont Community Services and authorize to increase the Office of the Sheriff's Personnel Account from 111 to 112 for the SITAC position with the understanding that if or when this position is no longer grant funded that the sheriff's office will absorb this position back into the current personnel count of 111 within the existing sheriff's department's budget at that at such time okay we have a motion do we have a second second okay we have a motion and a second on the floor any discussion seeing none madam clerk will you take a roll call vote please Supervisor Smith? Yes. 
Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Nick Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Chairman Thompson? I'm sorry, Chairman Tatum? <laughs> yes. Uh, Supervisor Thompson and Supervisor Cundiff are absent for the vote. Okay, thank you. And Sheriff, I, before you leave, I do want to say uh, how much I appreciate the rapid response from both you and Ms. Cobbs. Uh, last week I had to arrest, arrest a person on firm campus that was trespassing and could have been a potential problem. And I later found out that he had been on our firm elementary campus and I contacted you and, and got with, you got with Ms. Cobbs and your speedy response. Uh, I have no doubt uh, probably prevented something very, a whole lot worse could have happened. And, uh, and I appreciate the w rapid response. And I know the parents in Franklin County, if they knew that how quickly y'all jumped on that, would really appreciate the effort you take with your SROs and the school staff to protect our children. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Mr. Team, very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman? Yes. The CLIA certification, when you said you guys were going to have a ceremony? Yes, so that date is going to be March 7th at Ferrum College, but you will be getting a formal invitation, but it is set for March 7th at Ferrum College. I can probably find that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much again. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas Bill. Sure. All right, rolling right along. Amanda Cox. Mr. Nice Chairman, to see you today. Members of the board, thank you for having me. Amanda Cox with Appalachian Power. I um, wanted to give you guys an update on some projects and programs that we're working on. Um, Steve, I'm not sure how much you've shared about the broadband project. A bit. Just a little bit, okay. Well, so we have been working with River Street, our engineering teams and our construction teams. We, we have not um, let any grass grow underneath us. We're doing everything that we can to uh, have all of our ducks in a row. We're preparing for a filing with the State Corporation Commission. February 1st is our deadline to do that. Um, you know, it, it, they do have up to six months to approve our last project in Bland and Montgomery. They are approved a little uh, sooner than the six months, so we're hoping that that trend continues. Um, I know sometimes there's a little concern with that regulatory piece that we have to go through, but keep in mind, that's kind of the beauty of this project. We are going to be in the power zone, so about a foot below the neutral, which means a lot of that work that's done in the communication space on the poles will not have to be done because of this partnership. And I can tell you with the state putting roughly $300 million in broadband dollars just in our service territory, there's a lag um, with getting that make ready piece done. So I do feel like we'll make some of that up um, as we're waiting for the commission to make their, their final ruling. Um, I'm sure uh, you've talked a little bit about, we talked about that window. We'll have some uh, detailed engineering, procurement, permitting, things like that, that will occur after a hopeful approval. And then we'll start working on construction. Another really good part of this project is that as we uh, construct the line and we splice and we test, the last mile provider can come in and connect in segments. So you don't have to wait for the entire build for the fiber to be lit and folks to be connected. So um, we haven't decided exactly where we're going to start, what this looks like. I can tell you uh, where Steve's pushing us to start. Uh, so we, we've been working with all of our localities to figure out the best places, uh, what makes the most sense in all three of those counties. And we're going to listen to our partners and we're gonna do our best to go as quickly and as safely as we can to get folks connected um, as soon as we get that hopeful approval from the SCC. So we are doing our due diligence. We're meeting with the localities in your planning commission and keeping them up to speed with everything. But our engineering teams are meeting, uh, I believe bi-weekly at this point, and I've seen lots of emails floating around. So they're, they're getting a lot of good work done on your behalf. Um, so are there any questions about that project? I know we've been talking about it for a while and it takes some time, but I, I do feel that we're, we're really close. I've got some um, calendar invites for working on this filing and my testimony for what this looks like to the SCC. So we're we're moving along for sure. May I? Sure. Hi, Amanda, welcome. Thank you. Just a quick question, just to clarify what, what I think I heard. February 1st is the deadline for what again? February 1st is our own internal deadline Your that internal. we've set for us to file with the State Corporation Commission. Okay, um, and in the in the state that the SEC's in, they're down a member. 
there's going to be potential further delay, correct? Well, they're down. Yeah, they're down a couple of. They're down a couple. Now. So I, I do believe that that we'll see action from the legislature. I think that we'll see judges appointed, and um, I, you know, I'm fingers crossed that that we won't see any of the business of the state um, go undone. I do think that we'll <clears throat> we'll see some appointments, hopefully, and we're we're crossing our fingers that that we don't skip a beat on that and it doesn't delay. Well, we appreciate. Um, expediting you know and and being dedicated to that timeline um, because we as a board of course and a broadband authority um, are set trying to set expectations with the citizens of Franklin County and so it's hard to explain um, statutory delays and so forth to the general public so um, anything that AEP can continue to do um, to expedite and assist us is greatly appreciated. Yes, ma'am. And we're we're working with the counties and the planning commission to make sure that we've got messaging on websites and social media and okay. things of that nature that we're we're keeping folks up to speed. If if you think we need to do something, you're seeing something that that's not happening, please let me know. I'll, I'll make sure that our team gets right on it. Thank you, Amanda. Ma'am. Anyone else have any questions for Amanda while she's here? <clears throat> I got a couple other things to okay. talk about too. Go um, right ahead. The second one, and I've been working with economic development on the business site ready expansion uh, that we're looking at potentially for Summit View. We've had a pilot program in place uh, with with the legislature since 2019. We've seen some definite success in our service territory. We built out to a park in uh, Henry County that has since had a couple of big announcements. One, I believe, was their biggest capital investment to date, and several hundred jobs. Uh, we have uh, just now, I believe last week, an in-service date for the Berry Hill uh, Industrial Park. And so there is legislation that will be run in 2023 that makes this kind of a normal part of our business for investor-owned utilities and allows up to two projects per year. It also opens up parameters for qualifications and uh, due to that, Franklin County is eligible as a, as a Tier 4 VEDP site if the bill passes. So what does that mean? Uh, it could mean a dedicated station for Summit View Park. And um, I know Mike just stepped out, but of course it will provide tremendous power quality for the park. Definitely if you have power sensitive customers, which I assume that's probably on your high growth, high demand target list there. Um, and it'll be critical as you're working with folks like that. Capacity will increase tremendously. And I know you guys are having a work session, so I'm happy to dig into those technical details if we need to um, but we are we are going to be working hard and, and for hopeful passage of the bill in 2023 i've had meetings with beth we're looking at where does that station need to need to be located to serve uh you know targets and, and customers that you already have and um, we're, we're going to definitely work with you guys hand in hand if you make that application to vedp and um, i think it'll be a really good solution for summit view any questions on that? <clears throat> okay. Um, also, wanted to, I know there's been a lot of discussion about uh, the shoreline management plan, and there have been some questions and concerns. Um, I've had some very frank discussions with Supervisor, Supervisor Ronnie Mitchell, so I understand um, you know, what some of those are. I just want to let you guys know we've taken some of those back internally. We're having conversations to figure out how we address uh, any inefficiencies that, that we have. And I've also invited Supervisor Mitchell to attend one of those meetings to talk firsthand about some of the challenges and issues that have been raised. And we're gonna do our very best to figure out how we can correct those and make sure that we, uh, that we help you guys understand the mandates that we have through FERC and sometimes some of those things are out of our hands, but also how can we be flexible and, and work with the county? You guys are strong partners. Uh, we, we love working with you at every turn. So definitely heard your message loud and clear. We're going to make sure that we have you in front of the right people and that we're doing everything we can to address your concerns. May I make a comment, sure. Mr. Reister? Amanda, I'm sorry to bug you again. No, you're fine. <laughs> um, I am a chairman of the TLAC Board of Directors. And, and, and Neil is aware of this. Um, but our executive committee, which are the four county administrators, um, we are planning on seating um, a work group that's going to be doing a, a cursory SMP review in 2023. Okay. I've, I've also talked to um, 
oh gosh, I'm having a, a blank here. Anyway, um, but to seat the to seat this work group that would holistically look at the S and P as it relates to Smith Mountain Lake um, and the pump back program, of course, and of course taking in any other suggestions and observations from this board. So our intention, just to let you know, is to seat that group and then to engage um, some citizen groups, maybe by category, whether they be you know a group of small business, large business. Uh, dock builders, et cetera, et cetera, where we can have some focus groups to make sure that we're hearing from all segments of our community because um, I'm understanding that you guys are going to pull the trigger pretty quickly in 2024 on scheduling hearings uh, and comment periods and so forth. Mm -hmm. So from a TLAC um, local perspective, we want to make sure we're ready to contribute meaningfully uh, to that conversation with you guys. And I just wanted to let you know, if you hadn't heard of that yet, that, that we are going to try to be a meaningful part of your process. Yes, ma'am. And we appreciate that. And we, we definitely need that input um, so that we, that we can you know, take that to the folks that are, that are setting our rules and regulations. So I appreciate that. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. I'd just like to comment uh, and tell you thank you for um, really helping me with the what we talked about. And um, uh, it's nice having somebody that understands and uh, is willing to help with make improvements with, with the shoreline management <clears throat> staff that you, that you all have. So uh, I really, really appreciate it. And um, it's nice that AAP has someone like you that uh, is a go-getter to, to really try to get um, – some solutions to some of these problems and uh, also thank you for uh, looking out for our firefighters and the other situation we had the other day too so yes, thank you so much for that and I really appreciate your efforts absolutely and I encourage you guys if you have in and Chris knows Steve you all know this if you have anything going on please let me know I uh, I will do my best to get the right people if I don't know the answer and turn it around as quickly as possible thank you okay anyone else I would just add, Mr. Chairman, um, really appreciate the partnership with Amanda Appalachian Power, and I'd echo uh, Supervisor Mitchell's comments. Uh, they're a great partner, and we really appreciate, especially Amanda, all the work that you're shepherding uh, yourself with, with Beth uh, on the business sites readiness. That, that's a tremendous project. It will, it will add tremendous value if that uh, takes place and occurs uh, to our business park, and I just want to thank you. Absolutely. I'm glad to be a part of it. Thank you for having me. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Thank you. All right. If anyone else doesn't have anything, we'll take a, about a 10-minute break, and we'll reconvene back in B-75. Um, I would like to certify that only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed session to which the certification uh, resolution applies, and only such business matters as were identified in the motion by which the closed session was convened were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting to which this certification applies. Okay, do we have a second? Second. Okay, any discussion? We're missing two members. Yeah, well, I think we need to wait for a couple of members to come yeah. back before we can take a vote. Yes. Where's Nick? Now we have a quorum. Yeah. Okay. Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call vote, please? Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Lori Smith? Yes. Chairman Tatum? Yes. Uh, Supervisor Nick Mitchell, Ronnie Thompson, and Tommy Cundiff are absent for the vote. All right. Uh, next item of business, uh, committee appointments. Anyone have any committee appointments they would like to make at this time? I have one uh, to the Recreation Advisory Commission. I want to nominate uh, Terry Dameron to the RAC. Uh, many of you know Terry. He's a lieutenant with the Sheriff's Office. Before that, he worked for Rocky Mount Police Department. He's a Franklin County native. He lives in the Ferrum section of Franklin County. He has uh, young children that are active in our parks and rec, and he's he's been active for several years. And I think he'll do a great job on the on the rack. And I would like to nominate him at this time. I will second that. 
Any discussion about nominating Terry to the to the rack? <clears throat> Seeing none. All in favor, let me know I'm saying aye. Aye. All <clears throat> opposed, same sign. Let the record show that there were none opposed. Are there any other appointments at this time? Okay. Seeing none, I'll ask for Lisa Cooper to come on up. Lisa, you're here to tell us about a <clears throat> application for a rezone. Yes, sir. I am. All right. You want to give us a background on that, please? Sure. No problem. Good evening to you all. Um, as um, Vice Chairman um, Tatum said, this is a rezoning request. Um, Arrington Properties North LLC has been operating at Plateau Plaza for years on uh, property um, designated or identified as 036011308, the tax map number. The current zoning on these parcels are R1, B2, and M1. The request for the rezoning is going to be taking um, <coughs> these several properties and placing them into PCD, which is our planned commercial development. As you all are aware, the businesses on this property is a gas station and two fast food change chains. Arrington Properties North LLC purchased the Williams property that is directly behind um, Plateau Plaza, this complex. And um, the single family dwelling, um, just for a bit of clarification, it actually straddles the property line and part of the house is zoned B2 and part of the house is zoned R1. So this is a way for us to clean up the rezoning for all the properties that Arrington Properties own and place it into the plan community development. Um, with the total acreage of all these properties are 13.88 acres. Um, the rezoning, like I said, will allow us to get rid of the split zoning and have one zoning on the parcels. Um, the petitioner does plan to vacate the lines um, to make this one large parcel. Also, um, there'll be another request after this one for a special use permit for the single family dwelling that is allowed with a special use permit in the PCD district. Um, the project entrance uh, would move instead of um, turning in on Wurtz Road where you do now, it would move further down and the concept plan will show this. Um, this would, the new entrance would allow Bojangles um, to have their people going in their drive through to successfully be able to stack on a two lane drive through so um, that they won't be backing up on Wurtz Road. This will help with safety issues. Um, also, there will be more parking added to this um, development, and there is a possibility that there will be e EV changing, I mean, charging stations with more people getting electric vehicles um, along Route 220. They're going to need somewhere to charge um, their cars. Um, the Board of Supervisors in 1993 rezoned the Arrington um, properties, the tax parcel number 036-00184 from R1 to B2 for proposed commercial use. Um, staff did receive one inquiry before the Planning Commission meeting, and that inquiry was just with the concept plan, what was, um, what was actually going to be taking place across the street from them. We like to give you a vicinity map, but I'm sure you all are familiar with where this is located on Route 220. Um, just to let you know, the area, this is an aerial view. Um, the area in the blue is what we're rezoning. The house that I was talking about straddles this line right here. We also like to give you the um, future land use map. If you will notice, um, this parcel is so uh, it, it's the future land use is commercial mixed use and you can see that a lot of the properties around it would be commercial a couple of residentials in the back and across the street but you expect this in your designated growth areas and along route 220 you do have houses that support the commercial uses 
on Route 220. We also like to show you a zoning map. Um, just to let you know, this right here is the M1 property. This is the B2 property, and this is the R1 property. So if the rezoning goes through, all this will be planned commercial development, just like it is across the street, or across Route 220, not the street, the highway. Um, in your packet, there was there is a survey that has been done of the whole um, complex area, so we wanted to include that in your packet. This is the concept plan that was um, included in your packet, as you can see where I was talking about Wurtz Road, instead of coming in right here at the building, you would come in here. There'll be a way for you to go through the drive-through to get through Bojangles. Um, also, you'll still be able to go through the drive-through the same way for Dairy Queen that you do now. The additional parking for not only vehicles, but also for RVs or um, uh, tr trucks that have trailers on them. Um, this is, and Mr. Arrington can talk to this more, this would be the expansion of the building in order for uh, Bojangles um, to expand, and he can explain that in more detail. Staff's analysis, um, this proposed use for the rezone, we like it because it's gonna eliminate three zonings on this property and place it under plan commercial development, which is mainly uh, commercial uses, <clears throat> but you can have residential uses to go along with it. Um, it's expanding an existing building, a business that has been in the county for a very long time and adding additional parking and the e EV charging stations. It's improving traffic along Wurtz Road. You will not have traffic backing out onto Wurtz Road and possibly 220 with the uh, double drive through lane. This will definitely improve the congestion of the area. Um, <clears throat> The PCD rezoning will allow for the special use permit for the single family dwelling um, to stay a residence instead of having to, um, to convert to commercial. The expansion, expansion of this business and the improvement to the site will allow for better services for those traveling through the county and those who reside in the county and on Wurtz Road. The expansion of this business improves the interior of the property, would be enhancing the designated growth area. Also staff analysis, this is in the future land use map in the commercial mixed use area. We would expect to see businesses expand in this area. It is also located in one of your designated growth areas, which is 220 North Corridor. We do expect to see expansion on commercial, but also still keeping residential that surrounds it to support. The Planning Commission did hold their public hearing. They voted six in favor, one was absent, to recommend the rezoning. The only proffer that was offered is for it to be developed in with the conceptual plan. And I would be glad to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Anyone have any questions? I have a quick one, if I may. Lisa, um, I'm noticing um, VDOT's development review team remarks yes. um, indicate that the access management exception um, would need to be it, it submitted. Um, yes. As it appears, it doesn't currently meet their standards. Are we optimistic that mm -hmm. with, with the interviews with the applicant that we're going to be able to get there on the VDOT uh, notations that are in the report? Yes, I do think so. The, um, and Mr. Arrington has talked to VDOT um, on a couple occasions for this, and of course staff has too. The reason why it's the access management is because the closeness to um, the church entrance and exit. Mm -hmm. um, we do feel that they would be able to get that waiver. There are, um, VDOT does make waivers to access management. I know um, they actually, across the street on Route 220, made one for the sheets. Um, so I do feel that this is a um, something that should be able to go through. Okay. And so the other analyses that Lisa Lewis had made for you know uh, left turn, left right turn analyses and so forth. I'm only asking these questions because that's a busy corner. It is, and. The reason why, uh, basically, the 
Mr. Arrington's engineer will have to give those analysis, and he'll he'll also justify the access management right uh, waiver when he asks for it. Um, but I do think, and I think if VDOT was here to talk to you, getting the traffic off of Works Road so it doesn't back up onto 20, onto 220 is a positive mm -hmm. because of all of us have been in that area, whether you're trying to get into Bojangles or go to the church or just go straight down Works Road. Um, so staff does feel like that this is a good um, improvement for that business. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't see any other questions. And Mr. Arrington is here. Okay. Um, do y'all like to come up? We'll state your name and address to the in the microphone, please. We know who you are, but we need it for the record. I'm David Arrington with Arrington Enterprises. My address is 90 Sherwood Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia. Thank you. Brian Sitton. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the project was... Uh, we know we had a problem in the drive through when you can't stack now but two cars behind the menu board and it puts you in the road and we got to fix that issue. And what we've done is this site plan here, if you'll notice, the entrance to the new site is offset from the church. The church is a little bit further down the road. But I think they, the criteria that we'd have to have to the exception for was the distance between the one going to the church and ours. They didn't want it straight across, okay? They didn't want that, but they thought they could make this work. And I didn't hear any other uh, concerns from VDOT when I spoke with them. You know, they left me thinking they could make it work, Great. okay? So, uh, but the big improvement is one, more parking, the double drive through lane will give me up to 18 cars in the line where now I can have six, you know, and I'm out in the road. But I can get six, I can get up to 18 cars in this stack. Uh, we're given a lot more room for, I call it small truck, boats, campers, parking along the back. And it looks like we've got close to 12 to 15 different, you know, spots for them. And it will just clean our whole congestion up in a lot of ways. If you'll notice when you come from the gas pumps and you're gonna go back to Wirtz Road, right where the curve is in the road is about where our entrance is now. And we're going way on down to the far end, taking all that traffic away and on down to in an organized method to get out and in, you know, from that mm -hmm. area. If you'll also notice you got two lanes going all the way around the outside perimeter of that property. So we think those two, two or three uh, improvements will make a big difference in the traffic, okay? Another reason we wanted to do it was our Bojangles has outgrown its facility and we're wanting to put the kitchen completely on the back of the building. So we're adding 20 foot plus width all the way down the whole length of the building. About half of that will be the new Bojangles kitchen and we'll have new restrooms on one end and the other end will be just storage room for Dairy Queen and that improvement on that end. Over the next three, let's say starting this project, we'll get all our planning done in 2023. 2024, we look to start construction. And then uh, as we move through the construction, we hope to do a remodel of the Bojangles side first, coming around to the Dairy Queen, redoing that, and coming through the lobby and convenience store, maybe in three different parts. I'm not sure, but that's our plans. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Arrington? I just have a comment. Go ahead. <clears throat> to me, this is great common sense. This, this is perfect because you're right. I can't tell you how many times the drive throughs got traffic backed out, and sometimes we'll end up stopping cars right there yes on the uh passing lane to 220 so uh, i think this is a great idea thank you anyone else thank you thank you was anyone else here that like to speak to this okay at this time we'll open the floor to public comment on this item do we madam clerk do we have anyone signed up to want to speak in regard to that 
No, sir, we don't have any speak item. Okay. I'll uh, ask, offer an invitation if there's anyone here that would like to speak in regard to this project. Uh, feel free to come forward. Okay, seeing none, we'll close the floor for public hearing and we'll go back into open meeting. It's a pleasure. Or for discussion, if you have anything, any comments or any motion, go ahead. <clears throat> Make sure I'm on the right one, Mr. Chairman. Hold on. All right. Twelve. Yep. All right. You ready, Mr. Chairman? Go right ahead. I find that the proposed rezone will not be of substantial detriment to the adjacent property. That the character of the surrounding area will not be changed thereby and that such rezoning will be in harmony with the purpose and intent of the county code, the uses permitted by right in the zoning district, and with the public health, safety, and general welfare to the community. Therefore, I move to recommend approval of the request to rezone the approximate 13.88 acres of property from R1 residential suburban, B2 general business, M1 light industry, two PCD planned commercial development with one proffer. Okay. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion? <clears throat> Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call vote, please? Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Nick Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Chairman Tatum? Yes. Supervisor Cundiff and Supervisor Thompson are absent for the vote. <coughs> All right. Uh, Ms. Cooper, item number two, application for special use permit. I'll let you give us the background on this one. Thank you. Um, this is the special use permit that I uh, spoke briefly about in the rezoning. Um, Arrington Properties North LLC would like to take this um, single family dwelling um, and renovate it and be able to rent it. Um, this parcel also has a detached garage, but the garage would just be used um, as a garage for residential property. Um, as I said before, the existing house um, sits on two property lines since um, you just rezoned it to plan commercial development. That helps bring it into compliance. The special use permit will allow for this house to continue in the plan commercial district. The property can be accessed right now by Wurtz Road and Wingfield Road, which is a private road. Um, as I stated before, the property owner plans to vacate uh, the property lines, but in a PCD district, you are allowed to have commercial businesses and um, single family or residential on the same lot. Um, after the boundary line adjustment, the parcel will be 13.88 acres. Again, we had one inquiry. Um, before the hearing of what the um, special use permit was for. We also, I wanted to mention at the Planning Commission uh, meeting, we did have one citizen um, vote their concerns about the private road and this house having access to that private road. Um, again, you know where the property is located. Again, it is in the commercial mixed use, um, future land use. Um, we do expect to find residential in this along with commercial. Um, the rezoning now, if once we get it changed on the um, GIS, you would notice that this would be now since you've rezoned it to plan commercial development. Um, just to let you know, um, here is the existing house. Um, basically, it's not shown on here, but the private road comes around to the back of it and, and has access to the property. Um, in accordance with Section 25392 of the County Ordinance, single-family uh, resident lots are permitted in the plan commercial development with a special use permit approved by you. Um, per Section 25402, um, the concept plan, the PCD district allows for flexibility to adjust certain lot setbacks, designs, guidelines, and restrictions. 
Um, also in the zoning ordinance under the PCD, the 25393B um, sets the maximum density at this point in time. Um, the Mr. Arrington and Arrington Properties, there's only one this single family on this property. In the future, if he wanted to expand that, you he would come back to the Board of Supervisors. Um, the applicant does plan to rent um, this structure, and I think he's thinking long-term rental. And with the need for housing in Franklin County, having a house come back um, for rent would be nice. Um, also, just to keep in mind, it is in the designated growth area again. We do expect to see housing in the designated growth area to support commercial. And just to let you know, your planning commission did hold their public hearing. They did vote six in favor, one absent, to recommend the special um, use permit with one uh, condition, and that is for it to be developed um, and substantial with the concept plan. I would be glad to answer any questions, and Mr. Arrington is also here to speak if you have any questions, and he may want to tell you a little bit about the house. Okay. Anyone have any questions for Ms. Cooper? Uh, I just have a quick one. Lisa, are there any plans for further structure development on this 13.88 acres? I don't think at this time there is. I know um, there is future possible parking in this area, but at this time, the, the large parcel that you only see part of it here, the only thing um, my understanding and Mr. Arrington can answer this is they just want to renovate this house. Um, if they would decide to expand the business back here or they decide they want to develop more housing, then we would come back to you, um, the Planning Commission at, and the board, to ask you to um, accept the new concept plan to see if you think it's still in line with the comp plan and the designated growth area. Because the PCD district. is going to give them a lot more flexibility. PCD will give them a lot more flexibility. It is nice that it's all under one zoning now, and because I mean, his main core of his business was an M1. Yeah. It's not usually where you find a gas station and two fast food chains. Thanks, Lisa. No problem. Anyone else? <clears throat> Mr. Arrington, is there anything you'd like to add to what Ms. Cooper has informed us of? No, she pretty much covered everything. If there was anything that may need to be discussed or told, I have met with the people on Winfield Lane, and they do have a, a an association for road upkeep. We've agreed to uh, be participate in that when that comes up. But uh, there's a driveway that comes up the backside, and it's been there for years. It pretty much access the trailer that's there on the property. Mm -hmm. The trailer will be torn down and gotten rid of, uh, and we'll use that drive that comes up to the house and that will be the main entrance for the house. That way we can separate our, in our minds, business and, and residential. And plus we're gonna put a fence. There's fences in this plan uh, that will block the view of the house. You won't be able to see it from the parking lot, that type thing, so. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Arrington? Okay, thank you. At this time, I'll open the floor for public hearing on this matter. So, anyone signed up, Madam Clerk, to speak on this? No, sir, I don't have any speakers for this item. Okay, is there anyone in the gallery that would like to speak concerning this, this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go back into regular session. Members, what's your pleasure? You need a motion? Yes, I do. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion. I find that the use will not be of substantial detriment to adjacent properties, that the character of the zoning district will not be changed thereby, and that such use will be in harmony with the uses permitted by right in the zoning district <clears throat> and with the public health, safety, and general welfare to the community. Therefore, I move to recommend approval of the applicant's request for a special use permit to allow for residential use in accordance with section 25-392 and section 25-402 of the zoning ordinance with the one condition as recommended by the planning commission second 
All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, will you take a roll call vote, please? Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Nick Mitchell? Yes. Chairman Tatum? Yes. Supervisor Cundiff and Supervisor Thompson are absent for the vote. Okay. Item three, Ms. Cooper. This is a uh, application for a special use permit. <clears throat> Yes, sir, it is. This is an application for a special use permit. Um, AccuPoint Surveying is submitting the application for Shirley Ferris for Lakewood Storage uh, for an expansion of the self-storage facility with an, outdoor, with an outdoor storage and office on the property. The expansion will take place on approximately 1.62 acres, which is currently zoned A1 agricultural. The property is located on Lakewood Forest Road near the intersection of Lakewood Forest Road and Palm Drive. Uh, Lakewood, Lakewood Forest is a state maintained road. This property is located in the Westlake Hills Ford designated growth area. The property also has an existing well, septic and drain field um, and um, it's on this vacant piece of property. The storage facility will consist of 10 self-storage units, 10 by 15, 13 self-storage units, 10 by 20, <clears throat> excuse me, and 11 self-storage units, 10 by 30, for a total of 34 units. The outdoor display will be located in the front and on the side of the office and shall be fenced. Um, the outdoor storage area shall be used for boats, boat trailers, recreational vehicles, and other watercraft. In May of 2005, the Board of Supervisors approved a special use permit for a self-storage facility for Ms. Ferris. It's the one that's right next door that you'll see on the conceptual plan. Um, the self-storage facility is called Lakewood Mini Storage, located at 325 Lakewood Forest Road. Um, the proposed self-storage facility, as I said, is it existing, is, is next to the existing. Um, staff has not received any comments on this petition. We like to give you um, a vicinity map of where it's located in the Gills Creek area. Um, this is a aerial view. This is the vacant piece of property where, uh, if approved, the new uh, self-storage unit would go. This is Miss, <clears throat> excuse me, this is Miss Ferris current um, self storage unit. You will notice that there is a house if you've been out to the property. Miss Ferris, I think, uses this approximately as her office. Right now, it is not, um, as far as I know, AccuPoint can answer this question. No one lives in this house at this time. She uses it more as an office. Um, this is your, <clears throat> excuse me, your future land use map. If you notice, this property is located in the commercial mixed use um, part of the future land use map. You'll notice all the commercial around um, for the future. This, the yellow is residential. And this purple back here is residential mixed use. We also like to give you the zoning um, map of the property. You will notice um, that the existing storage facility and the proposed is zoned A1, which is requiring the special use permit. The red is um, B2 zoning of property. Across the street is RC1, which is a residential combined subdivision, and it's a mixture of um, housing. Um, Lakewood storage, um, they have, if you noticed in your packet, it looks like that you have a complete site plan. I think one reason, it, before they knew they had to get a special use permit, they had already started work on it. So the one I wanna use, um, this is the concept plan. Um, you'll see that these are the self storage facilities I was talking about. This is the office, this is the outdoor. This is landscaping around the property. And AccuPoint can talk more about the drain field and the existing well. This would be the entrance to the property. 
I'm going to fast forward these in case you have any questions. We can come back to them. Um, <clears throat> just to let you know, staff analysis, the nearby parcels uh, consist of commercial uses with two other self-storage um, facilities. Um, with a few single family dwellings in between the commercial uses and there is a mobile home park that is located behind the proposed self storage area. The zonings of the parcels, the zoning of this, the surrounding parcels are A1, B2, and I said um, RC1, the residential combined. Um, there is one single family that is located um, on the same property, but as I said, um, I think that is used as an office, and there is a large evergreen buffer that actually separates um, the self-storage facility from the new proposed self-storage facility. The other single-family dwellings do not have screening for this property. However, um, as you'll see in the condition, a landscape buffer should be uh, will be supplied, and you can see from the concept plan that there are plantings along the side where the single family dwelling that someone does live in. The Euro Planning Commission did hold a public hearing and they did vote for a recommend approval of the special use permit with a six in favor and one absent vote. Um, I'll go briefly through the <coughs> conditions they put on it. The first one is for the proposed use to be substantial conformance to the concept plan entitled Lakewood Storage. Um, also, the landscape buffer to be along the entire property line to the maximum extent allowed as it complies to the stormwater management. The fence around the outdoor storage area shall be of opaque material and forest green in color. Virginia Department of Ho Health shall approve compliance with respect to the water supply and waste disposal of this facility. The uh, Virginia Department of Health shall approve, all, shall approve all permits authorized proposed for this use in final site plan review. Um, site erosion, settlement control, and stormwater will be required. Signage on building walls and or fences shall be prohibited. The sign is limited to a single monument sign. Overall height of the sign shall not exceed eight feet in height and 32 square feet in sign-faced area. Outdoor storage area shall only be used for legally tagged boats, boat trailers, recreational vehicles, and other watercraft, and operable boats, boat trailers, recreational vehicles, and other watercraft shall be prohibited. The stormwater managing pond shall be fenced. I would be glad to answer any questions um, that you have. Anyone and have any, anyone have any questions here. for Ms. Cooper? Okay, I don't see anyone. Is, is there someone else here that would like to speak to this? Actually, Amy with uh, AccuPoint. Okay. If you will, state your name and address for us, please. Sure. Good evening, uh, board members. My name is Amy Sipe. I'm the majority partner and principal engineer of AccuPoint Surveying and Design, 6200 Ford Avenue, Lynchburg, Virginia. <clears throat> Merry Christmas and happy holidays as well. Merry Christmas. It's, it's coming quick. So um, <clears throat> we've been working with Ms. Ferris on her expansion project. Um, if any of you have visited the site, um, it, it's a... For self-storage, it's a great site. She keeps a very clean property. She monitors it. Unfortunately, she's had some health concerns and couldn't be here tonight, so I know that she sends her regards. Um, as, as Lisa mentioned, we, we have made it a little further down the road than typically a concept plan, um, but a lot of these details, we want to make sure that we um, present the best and complete picture to you for you to make a decision um, and, and that it can actually work in what we show on the concept plan. Um, this property was previously owned um, by some folks who, who wanted to do a different use and then, w for whatever reason, chose to sell the property. But in the meantime, they did install a drain field and a well up to that point. Um, so that was something that already exists uh, for the property. Um, it's a substantially large drain field that's not needed for clearly a one restroom 
um, office. So likely we will reduce the size of that um, just to give some more area that, that's not needed. Um, the well that's in place is, <clears throat> excuse me, clearly in proximity to the drain field and it meets all the current VDH requirements for separation. So that's not of concern as far as um, any type of, of use that way. Um, as Lisa mentioned, the buffer that is along the existing self-storage uh, is has grown up for almost 20, 18 to 20 years now, so it's um, past maturity and, and well in place, and we would um, suspect that these trees would mature over time as well because it is a, a monitored facility. Um, someone there, Ms. Ferris, most of the time is there every day um, monitoring the property, so everything is kept well uh well in order and nice and tidy. Um, because of the uh, requirements for erosion and sedimentation control and stormwater, uh, we would need a stormwater facility in the rear. Uh, we had a discussion with that with the Planning Commission, just fencing for some safety. Um, they requested some plantings and we'll provide those, of course, um, as, as we can. There are some stormwater regulations that prevent plantings from being in certain areas for maintenance issues with stormwater. So we'll, we'll provide those as, as much as the, the regulations aren't in conflict. Um, we will have the fenced area for boat, watercraft, RV storage that are operable and tagged. Um, and I'm happy to answer any technical questions or, or just general questions about the project that you might have. Anyone have any questions? Just a quick one. Where on the rendering here is the stormwater pond? Um, let me let me go to the. Um, so it's actually behind. If you look on this map, it's actually behind all the buildings. Yeah. So so no one will see it. Um, it's it's actually pretty shallow as well, um, and of course meets all the discharge yeah. requirements. So um, I, I don't think it'll it'll be a problem at all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll open the floor for public comments on this item. Anyone signed up to speak on this, Madam Clerk? No, sir, I have no speakers on this item. Okay, is there anyone in, in the gallery that would like to speak to this item? Seeing none, we'll go back into regular session. Board, what's your pleasure? I'm willing to offer a motion when ready, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. I find that the use will not be of substantial detriment to adjacent properties, that the character of the zoning district will not be changed thereby, and that such use will be in harmony with the uses permitted by right in the zoning district and with the public health, safety, and general welfare to the community. Therefore, I move to recommend approval of the applicant's request for a special use permit to allow for a self-storage facility in accordance with section 25-179 of the zoning ordinance with the 10 conditions as recommended by the planning commission. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Motion's been made and we have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, we take a roll call please. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Nick Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Vice Chairman Tatum? Yes. Supervisor Thompson and Supervisor Cundiff are absent for the vote. Okay. Uh, item number four. The a hearing to consider an ordinance. This is pursuant to section 15.2-1211C of the Code of Virginia as amended. The Franklin County Board of Supervisors will consider an ordinance to provide that all sections of the Code of Virginia and the Code of Franklin County providing for the election or appointment on the basis of magistral districts shall be construed to provide for election or appointment on the basis of election districts. This ordinance is necessary to provide for consistent boundaries for appointments to boards, commissions, authorities, and committees as the current boundaries of the magistral and electoral districts of Franklin, in Franklin County are not consistent. Well, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I can yes. I can take this one. I think maybe Mr. Gwynn can can uh, assist on this one as well. Um, this ordinance is a, of course, a change to uh, the code. Whereas, um, when magisterial districts were initially uh, put in place in Franklin County, 
magisterial districts and election districts were one and the same, if you will. And so many of the county's boards and commissions, uh, the bylaws and so forth, are based on appointments from magisterial districts, which are not necessarily concurrent with current election districts. And so this is a matter of housekeeping logistically to make sure that this board, when they make appointments, are, are truly making those from election districts. And so, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, I would um, offer that as a way of introduction and certainly uh, lend to uh, the county attorney to, to fill in any uh, detail. <laughs> I really don't have much I can add to it. All right, so I guess this time we need to have a public hearing to see if anyone would like to speak in regard to this ordinance change. Madam Clerk, anyone signed up? No, sir, I have no speakers for this item. Okay, is there anyone in the gallery that would like to speak to this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go back into regular session. Board, what's your pleasure? Mr. Vice Chair, um, I would uh, make a motion that the board approve um, an ordinance uh, to provide consistency in the boundaries for appointments to boards, commissions, authorities, and committees under code section, Virginia Code Section 15.2-1211C. Okay. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, we take a roll call vote, please. Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Nick Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Chairman Tatum? Yes. Supervisor Cundiff and Supervisor Thompson are absent for the vote. Okay. Rolling like right along, item number five, Mr. Sandy, a hearing to consider an ordinance. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we have a public hearing scheduled for an amendment to Chapter 5, and that would be uh, relative to the building permit fees. Um, really, this is... Uh, devoted to uh, adding a fee for an uh, electrical permit for uh, utility scale solar facilities. So just some recap here on the screen that, that I mentioned earlier this afternoon about the zoning ordinance and comprehensive plan amendments that were adopted in July. Uh, the first siting agreement uh, was in November that was approved by the board. Uh, I think through this process, um, you know, we, we realized that we really don't have a designated fee for this type of use since this is kind of a new use uh, in the county and so uh, in November the board expressed the desire to add a specific uh, electrical fee for utility scale solar and that does require since it's in the county code that does require us to have a public hearing uh, before making that addition or amendments to that section. Uh, staff did some research on some other Virginia localities that do have um, a, a permit. Not everybody seems to have a, a permit for the utility scale solar yet, but many of them have uh, adopted. Uh, and some very recently, like Henry County, I think was just actually just a few weeks ago uh, that, that they actually adopted as well. So in your um, staff report, there's just a table that kind of has some of those fees. Uh, many of them seem to have adopted the same fee. Uh, the same fee schedule. So if you look at that, 10800 plus $15 for each additional watts, that seems to be one that has kind of been replicated across the state. Um, so what I did uh, in that final column was just, okay, for a, a 10 megawatt facility, what does that mean for each one of these fees? So that's what that far right column is, just an example uh, of what the fee would be for, for the same facility. Um, and you can see it kind of ranges from the low value of 6,500 uh, in Campbell County uh, up to uh, the 18,300 uh, for that. There's also uh, an example in Lunenburg County, what they did, uh, they didn't have it in their building permit fees, but in their siting agreement, they actually listed uh, that and their building permit fee was $50,000. In, in the siting agreement. And so I guess some, some folks, if they don't have it listed, maybe are doing it through their siting agreement as a, a secondary way to handle that. But again, that's not an exhaustive list. That's, that's just kind of a list of the ones that I could find uh, relatively easy. Uh, many, like I said earlier, many other places actually don't have a specific fee designated um, that at least that I could find uh, for utility scale solar. And my guess is they probably haven't had one 
in their locality yet um, that, that's come forward. So again, just a, a review found uh, that it range, you know, there was a, a various range. If you added and averaged those ones up in the table, it comes to about 15,000 um, for, for a project. Um, staff is recommending and what we've advertised is a, uh, just a simple fee of $2,000 uh, per megawatt or portion thereof. Um, and so going back to the table to that 10 megawatt facility, that would equal $20,000 uh, in that example w would be the fee that would be due uh, for a facility of that size. And so based on this table, that would be higher than, than the ones you do see here um, that are listed here so far. But again, less than that Lunenburg example, um, which was 50000 So if approved, the new fee would become effective immediately unless the board wanted to make it a different effective date, uh, and it would apply to utility scale solar projects in the zoned and the non-zoned areas. So uh, building permits and, and building inspections are countywide. They're not just uh, one area or the other. So uh, this fee would apply to any project uh, in the county. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have uh, related to that. And, and we do need to hold a, a public hearing and see if anyone's interested in uh, commenting on the proposed fees. Okay. Anyone have any questions? Just a quick one, if I may. Um, Steve, with our first approved siting agreement, um, this, of course, was not in place. And so that application will not be subjected to this, correct? No, they, they have not applied for a building permit yet. So if this was approved tonight, it would be in effect. Okay, I when didn't they realize for that. Okay. Permit. Correct. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I guess my point with the siting agreement is we probably could have put it in the siting agreement mm -hmm. as far as the fee, but we, we didn't. Okay, but the building permit is the key. Correct. That would be what okay. triggers this. Thank you. Anyone else? I would just add, Mr. Chairman, for a point of clarification, and Mr. Sandy has presented that, that this would apply to utility-scale solar facilities and not necessarily a residential small-scale solar facility. Mm -hmm. So this would not apply to someone that just has a house that would like solar panels for their home, but this is the large-scale utility-scale. Correct, correct. We, we do have a permit for those others, but it's a much smaller fee based on the electrical. Correct. Anyone else have any questions before we go to public hearing? All right, seeing none, Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up for this? No, sir, I have no speakers for this item. Okay, is there anyone in the gallery that would like to speak to this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll go back into regular session. Board, what's your pleasure? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll offer a motion. Okay. Uh, I make a motion to amend Chapter 5 of the Franklin County Code by adding a new electrical permit fee under Section 5-27 for utility-scale solar electrical permit of $2,000 per megawatt. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Second. Okay. We, any discussion at this point? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, can you take a roll call vote, please? Uh, yes, uh, Vice Chairman, just to um, clarify, the second motion was for Mr. Mitchell, correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, let me start the roll call. Supervisor Nick Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Vice Chairman Tatum? Yes. Supervisor Cundiff and Supervisor Thompson are absent for the vote. Okay. And moving on down, item number six, I'll ask for Beth Sims to come forward, and we're going to have a hearing to consider the sale of county property. Good evening. Um, a few months ago, Leland Gardner and Sandy Gardner approached us. Um, they found on GIS that the county and town still owned uh, just over a three-acre parcel in the Franklin County Rocky Mount Industrial Park. Um, and they are planning an expansion of, of one of their businesses um, and wanted to, to locate in Rocky Mountain, Franklin County. 
Um, so it's a 3.05 acre piece of property, um, like I said, located in the Franklin County Rocky Mountain Industrial Park. Um, and they approached us about acquiring it um, and offered a price of $60,000. Um, and just as to clarify, this will be the final piece of property that we own there. Um, so, if, you know, if we go through with the sale of this, then we will have no more property there. Um, also, the town of Rocky Mount um, met last week on the same thing, and they approved the sale of the property pending Franklin County Board of Supervisors approval. Do you have any questions or anything? All right. Anyone have any questions for Beth? Yeah. Madam Clerk, do we have anyone signed up for this? No, sir. I have no speakers for this item. Okay. Well, opening the floor up for public comment, is there anyone in the gallery that would like to speak in regard to this item? Okay. Seeing none, we'll go back into regular session. What's your pleasure? Need a motion? Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve the sale of the 3.05 acre parcel in the Franklin County Rocky Mountain Industrial Park to JNS Hauling for $60,000 and authorize the county staff to coordinate with the town of Rocky Mount and JNS Hauling on the sales contract, thereby authorizing the county administrator and county attorney to execute the associated contract accordingly. Okay, we have a motion. Do, we, do I hear a second? Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, can you take a roll call, please? Supervisor Carter? Yes. Supervisor Smith? Yes. Supervisor Ronald Mitchell? Yes. Supervisor Nick Mitchell? Yes. Vice Chairman Tatum? Yes. Supervisor Cundiff and Supervisor Thompson are absent for the vote. Okay. All right. Uh, other matters by supervisors? I'll start over here to my immediate right, uh, Supervisor Mitchell. We'll start with you. So, Mr. Carter, I wasn't here. I had to step out for something really important, so <laughs> I apologize for that. But um, it wouldn't be a meeting for me not to bring up anything related to our firefighters. And uh, I got a uh, updated price, and I just want the board to um, keep this fresh in their mind. Uh, the Cali Fire Department. I uh, decided to um, get a quote on a different manufacturer and brought the cost significantly down for what we were looking at. Uh, it's about $452,000. So I'd like for this board to really consider uh, keeping, keeping them in the uh, current truck rotation for this upcoming budget year. Um, this is the only fire department I have in my district, and I would love to see them uh, stay on the, the current rotation and, and get this truck approved. And also, we, uh, last month we talked about the uh, money from the opioid settlement to put towards, I, I know it's a big concern for um, Chief Ferguson and Chief Luderman about the uh, cabin chassis for ambulances and the possible three years waiting to get one. And if, if we, do we have an update on whether we'll be able to use that money to maybe go ahead and start buying our own cabin chassis and then go ahead and start lining up uh, getting the boxes put on the cabin chassis so uh, our public safety ambulances don't fall behind on schedule because I know they're they're I know they have to have two or three coming due very soon so we need to we need to we need to be ready for that is that it that's it all right Supervisor Smith uh, yes I just have one thing uh, if I may I had received a piece of correspondence from uh, Mr. Atchew um, the Gills Creek School Board member giving us uh, an update on the CTE project. In that memo, um, they are requesting two members of the Board of Supervisors to participate on a steering committee that they're now appointing, which I believe is going to have a cross-section of the community on it as they continue to examine and build a program depending upon what, you know, the public input uh, which is going to be an important component of this. So I would ask if the board this evening, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, could determine who you want to appoint. Um, and I'd be happy, or through Madeline, um, to communicate this. I think the first meeting is coming up on January 11th from 1 to 4. All right. Do we have anyone that has an interest in serving on this steering committee? I do. Okay. Anyone else? I can, I mean, I can serve for this coming year, but you guys know that I'm. This won't go far. Yeah. I doubt. 
Okay. I mean, in terms of length. We're looking at like one meeting a month? I don't know. No. It's a three hour meeting. I mean, me and you, you know, started with it, so I'll stick, stick with it. Okay. All right. I would just ask if any of our colleagues, if you all would like to step in, we've been exposed, you know, to these issues. And if you'd like to step into this, it would be a great opportunity. Uh, I don't want to just do it because I've been doing it. Being that you put it that way, that you've been exposed, I don't know if they would want to or not. <laughs> I used the wrong word, didn't I? <laughs> but I don't, want, I don't want there to be just an assumption that because Mr. Mitchell and I have been serving as your liaisons that we would automatically step into this. It's an opportunity for any two supervisors. All right, Todd. Continue. I'm happy for them to continue as our liaison. All right, sounds good to me. Continue doing good work. Okay, I'll let I will let them know. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. All right, mm -hmm. Mr. Carter. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I received the Blue Ridge Soil and Water Conservation District Annual Report, which covers Franklin, Henry, Roanoke County, and the City of Roanoke, and I'd like for the board and the citizens to know that Alex Hunt and his wife were presented with the 2022 Roanoke River Grand Basin Award for Clean Water Farm, which is was quite a, yeah. an honor and I'm very proud of our farmers and agriculture here in Franklin County. And with that, I would like to wish you all a very Merry Christmas and I look forward to seeing you in January and county staff as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Nick Mitchell. I know there was a piece in the packet about the EMS coverage in Snow Creek, and I'll just ask that maybe some, I'm, I've spoke to several of you, but it's something that my constituents down there are really passionate about and they want to see it. And uh, I think we need to get Mr. Ferguson in here and talk about it and figure something out and get that going. Actually, we had a work session a couple of months ago that with public safety, and we do need to have some follow-up uh, sessions with public safety and and continue moving in the right direction and I think you're exactly right uh, we need to address that and uh, don't know that we can solve it all in one sit down work session but we need to get started and keep it keep it going so and we probably can't bite off the whole thing at once but if small steps gives good faith to them to the people that's the best way to eat an elephant one bite at a time yeah so Mr. Butler if we can Sure. In the near future. Sure. I have some thoughts on that, Mr. Chairman, are my items. And as we get into the budget session, because I know we do need this follow-up public safety session, um, as, as Mr. Mitchell noted, the, the concerns there and, and the replacement schedule and maintenance, a lot of things. So, yep. All right. Uh, let's see. Mr. Whitlow, I'm going to save your comments until after our public comment segment. So... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the time set aside in our meeting for public comment. Public comment gives each citizen an opportunity to address the board in person or in writing on matters appropriate to the responsibilities of the board. Speakers must direct all comments to the board as a whole and not individual board members or employees of the board or county. Personal attacks or insulting, profane, or vulgar language will not be tolerated. Likewise, commentary on issues that are not within the purview of the board and that are not a function of local government and over which we have no control are not acceptable. Public comment is not a question and answer session and board members will not answer questions during public comment. If a speaker violates these rules, the chair may rule the speaker out of order and upon a second violation have the speaker removed from the podium. Madam Clerk, please call the first speaker. Mr. Eric Ansbach, would you please come to the podium? State your name and address. Uh, my name is Eric Ansbach, 429 Creighton Drive, Rocky Mountain, Virginia, Blackwater District. A little closer to the mic, so. All right, there thank you. you. Um, I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak as the newly elected president of the Franklin County NAACP. My comments are in reference to the documents that uh, were previously, excuse me, provided you. Honoring civil rights activists and embracing their successes is appropriate and due. 
but when they're not accompanied by meaningful engagement with the difficult history of systematic violence perpetrated against black Americans for decades after slavery, such celebrations risk painting an incomplete and distorted picture. Until the opening of Equal Justice Initiative's National Memorial for Peace and Justice, Montgomery, Alabama in 2018, no prominent monument or memorial commemorated the thousands of African Americans who were lynched during the American era of racial terrorism. Of the 4,084 Southern lynchings documented in EJI's report, the overwhelming majority took place on sites that remain unmarked and unrecognized. In contrast, the landscape of the South is cluttered with plaques, statutes, and monuments that record, celebrate, and lionize generations of American defenders of white supremacy, including countless leaders of the Confederate war effort and white public officials and private citizens who perpetrated violent crimes against black citizens during the era of racial terror. One such person, Richard Woods, a black man, was lynched on January 26, 1880, right here in Franklin County, by a party of white men for deserting his wife and children and living with a white woman. The lack of public memorials acknowledging racial terrorism is a powerful statement about our failure to value African Americans who were killed or gravely wounded in this brutal campaign of racial violence. National commemoration of the atrocities inflicted on African Americans during decades of racial terrorism is an important step towards establishing trust between the survivors of racial terrorism and the governments and legal systems that failed to protect them. Meaningful public accountability is critical to bring the cycle of racial violence to a close. Formal spaces that memorialize mass violence help to establish trust between communities and build faith in government institutions. Only by telling the truth about the age of racial terror and collectively reflecting on this period and its legacy can we hope that our present day conversations about racial exclusion and inequality and any policies designed to address these issues will be accurate, thoughtful, and informed. So in conclusion, I request that you, the Franklin County Board of Supervisors and the Franklin County NAACP begin a conversation together, establish a working committee, and start the process of working with the Equal Justice Initiative for a memorial to Richard Woods at or near the site of his death. I want to thank you and I look forward to your response to my request. And I want to say Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Glenna Moore. Good evening, Glenna Hawkins Moore, Scenic River Drive, Snow Creek District. Court order books contain the minutes taken by the court clerk every time the court is in session. To give you a glimpse of African American life in Franklin County between 1786 and 1865, I'm sharing what I learned from the Franklin County court order books about our black ancestors. The status of African slaves as property was evident throughout Franklin County court records. Slaveholders were required to pay property tax on black enslaved people, as they would on their livestock, tools, or any other farm and business equipment. Franklin County's free Negroes never had the same freedom as whites. Virginia required all counties to keep updated records of free blacks. They had to be registered and numbered with a physical description to include their age, their height, their skin color, their trade, marks on their bodies, and how they acquired freedom. They were required to carry written passes at all times. If a free person of, of color moved to a different county, they were required to obtain a registration for that locality. Free blacks were prob problematic to the institution of slavery. In 1833, Franklin County Court appointed commissioners to aid and superintend the removal of free persons of color to migrate to the colony of Liberia in Africa. 
During the Civil War, the governor of Virginia requisitioned slaves from each county in Virginia to work on fortifications and other defensive works for the Confederacy. Franklin County sent 551 slaves. The court ordered the sheriff to carry these slaves to Richmond by way of Danville. A few months before the end of the Civil War, the Franklin County Court ordered the overseers of the poor to assign a large number of free black children to whites for apprenticeships in farming and housekeeping. These black children were as young as six years old. They were to be apprenticed until they were 18 to 21. They were to be paid a minuscule amount for the last year or sometimes the last three years of their apprentice. In 1865, the Franklin County Court ordered the police and posse of each district to patrol the Negroes in their districts. The statue represents a celebration of and a yearning for the Old South. Let's not go back. Happy holidays, everyone. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. David Kaplan. Hey, Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh, I'm Stephen Kaplan, 568 Thai Valley Lane over in Glade Hill. Um, I came out here to be talking to y'all about being homeless when it's supposed to be negative 20 degrees with the wind chill on Friday. Um, but that's going to tie together into this heritage that we're hearing about here tonight. Um, we've got something like 800 people that don't have a reliable address. We call them couch surfers. We call them homeless. They rented a place over here, but got kicked out, but that's the last place they can get mail. 800 people bouncing around. Um, we need to think about the way that we're caring for these individuals. A lot of these are the forgotten children of some of the biggest families in this town. Um, that focus on how do we change the narrative? How do we change the conversation from saying that someone is an addict or that someone is homeless to the understanding that someone is suffering from addiction, that someone is dealing with homelessness. Um, you know, when we're talking about zoning, we're happy to get more units. God bless you. Let's get some more units built. That's the first part of the big problem. But as we look at how we keep doing the same thing over and over again, we know we've got to change. We, we see that in these last two conversations. We've got to change. We don't lynch people anymore for having a biracial marriage or relationship. That's pretty dumb to us now, right? Um, we've, we've got to do better. And what we can do for that is we can participate with our community and we can bring folks together. Right now, there's a warming center over in Redwood um, that would love volunteers. That little church is taking on all of this burden by themselves. And... Um, Pardon the pun. That's not their cross to bear. They're, they're mighty nice for doing it. As we think about these things that we can do to get these conversations together about what our history was, we have to decide where we are right now, what we can do in this moment, and where we want this to go in the future. It's, it's a long road, but this, this is the heritage that we've got, and we've got to deal with all of it. Um, we need to make it easier for folks to get mental health support. We need folks that can understand what it's like to deal with addiction and not have the resources that they need just to get by. So I know that's a buzzkill. Have a Merry Christmas, everybody. But think about that when you're nice and warm this, this weekend. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Phyllis Dunnings.
Good evening. My name is Phyllis Dunnings, 965 Diamond Avenue, South. Um, the district is South Rocky Mount. Some of you all know who I am. Yes, I'm back. It's been almost two and a half years since I've been here. But we still have that problem of the train track. I understand they have that problem in Boone's Mill, but I don't have anything to do with Boone's Mill. <laughs> but this time last month, the train was on the track for almost an hour. That's ridiculous. It does not make sense. For the new people on the podium, it's a one-way in, one-way out area. Now, again, I don't understand why the board allowed someone to build a 44-unit senior citizen complex in that neighborhood with only one way in and one way out. What are they going to do? What are we supposed to do if there's an emergency? They can't get to us for anything, and we can't get out. So I have given you all some suggestions of ways out. <laughs> and I didn't go to the last person. I, I left it up to you all. But uh, it was one more resident that needed to be seen to see if they were willing to give up property as well for <clears throat> the exit. I just want to know where we stand with this. Everybody is getting fed up. I mean, we have people in that senior citizen complex, wheelchairs, walkers, oxygen. I mean, it's there. Mr. Mitchell knows. He's been over in there. And I don't mean no harm. Some of y'all might have relatives over in there. But it's, it's something long overdue. And something definitely needs to be done about it. Now, I don't know what y'all's, what your plans are, but something needs to be done. And I don't mean no harm. I don't want it to happen to somebody in my family, because if it do, somebody's going to be in some trouble. <laughs> yeah, y'all can take it in kind of what you want. Thank you. Y'all have a Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry you too. And a Happy New Year. Merry Christmas, fellas. <laughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, can staff get in touch with this fine young lady to see who this one resident might be? I think this board knows how passionate I am about fixing what she's talking about. And, and she hasn't been to a lot of meetings where I have spoke. Ms. Glenna Moore has seen me speak on it several times because she comes to every meeting. I'm just as passionate as that young lady as she is about finding a solution to this. And I'm with her. I want something done. I agree. I agree. Uh, if we can, Mr. Whitlow, if we can reach out to, be glad and to. get that person's name and make contact and see if it's a, a viable option that we can pursue. Thank you, ma'am. Madam Clerk, we have. I have no additional speakers. <laughs> okay. The floor is open for public comment. Do we have anyone else that would like to speak at this time? Seeing none, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for coming out and wish each one of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I pray that each one of you are safe and healthy and hope to see you back next month. Next year. <laughs> next year, yes. <laughs> thank you all. Uh, Mr. Whitlow, floor is yours. Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much, uh, members of the board. Um, just a few um, upcoming events just to like to remind the board. January 3rd is our organizational meeting of the board. Uh, we'll be holding that on that uh, Tuesday, January 3rd at 3 p.m. Of course, the business of the board, of course, you all approved that earlier today to schedule that meeting. Business of the board, of course, will be to uh, do our organizational work there at that meeting. But then also uh, our county attorney, Jim Gwynn, um, is going to be with us to uh, do a training session, I guess, if you will, for us, an overview 
of the FOIA and COIA uh, requirements of uh, elected officials, which is, of course, quire, required by code. And so, uh, Mr. Gwynn, I'm sure you'll be uh, dusting off your, your presentation, and we look forward to seeing that on January 3rd. Uh, January the 5th, two days later, uh, at 4.30 p.m., uh, is the rescheduled joint meeting with the Franklin County School Board. Uh, of course, there are three primary topics uh, that the mm -hmm. school superintendent has shared that uh, she will be looking and their staff to discuss with the board uh, their most recent market uh, study uh, results, as well as an update on the middle school project, the HVAC roof replacement project, as well as the Career Technical Education uh, Center and where they are with the preliminary planning on that. And Ms. Smith, the school system is doing some great communication because I also had a communication uh, from the superintendent for that very reason to make sure that we had two board members on that committee. Uh, she's also asked our assistant administrator, Mike Burnett, uh, also our economic development director. I think I saw a list. It was a, a preliminary list of folks that they would like to serve on that committee. So, uh, and, and as well as my office. And so we will, um, we'll be following up on that, and that, that upcoming meetings on January the 11th. Um, additional meeting um, for the board, and who, the board may be interested, on Thursday, January 19th, the Virginia Association of Counties and the Virginia Municipal League will hold their local government day there at the General Assembly in Richmond. It's an opportunity uh, to hear updates from this year's General Assembly, as well as in the afternoon, meet with the various uh, delegates and legislators. So if there's any interest from members of this board that would like to go and attend, uh, we do need to uh, make sure that we register with VACO by January the 3rd. We have time when we come back on the 3rd, and our staff could, uh, could certainly work uh, to make sure that uh, we make those uh, reservations. Um, in terms of uh, other holiday uh, news and so forth, I'm reminded of Land of Lights. If, if you're a citizen of Franklin County uh, and you haven't had a chance to get out to the recreation park there in Sontag, I know Mr. Mitchell, uh, you probably wear sunglasses in the evening uh, with all the lights uh, <laughs> over there uh, in, in, in Sontag, but uh, that's going to run through Christmas, uh, Christmas night this year. Um, in previous years, I think it's run through New Year's, but this year it always falls off after Christmas, uh, and so this year it just runs through Christmas, so just want to remind everyone with that. Um, and a couple of other um, follow-up items, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, members of the board. Um, from time to time, we have various uh, members uh, of the county staff that certainly we recognize, and we do that for years of service. And we recognize several this past May, if you all recall, we had several years of service and members. One of those is retiring this year. Um, we'll be retiring at the end of the month, and it's our assistant director of IT, Carol Dillon. Carol's been with the county 31 years, and so I really appreciate uh, all the knowledge and work that, that Carol has done, and we do have others in, in, in the system. But I just wanted to mention Carol uh, uh, this evening. I, I know Carol been an instrumental part uh, at, from time to time when we've gone through transition of, of IT directors. Carol has always been there. So a shout out to Carol. She's, uh, she's modest and, and doesn't necessarily want to be in the limelight, so, but I wanted to uh, take a shout out to her as well as all county employees. And certainly I'd be remiss um, if I did not mention county employees this evening and something um, that was mentioned earlier, and I really appreciate that uh, comments to VDOT. We know um, that the operations of government uh, do not necessarily stop on a holiday. Uh, specifically, our, our first responders, both volunteer and career, out in the cold, out in the elements, uh, as the uh, gentleman spoke earlier, uh, of, of folks that are having to experience the elements in our community, and as well as our landfill. Our landfill here in Franklin County runs 365 days per year. It doesn't shut down. Uh, those uh, gentlemen that work at the landfill work very, very hard. So a shout out to them, a shout out to all our first responders, law enforcement, fire EMS, uh, for all the work, because that continually must be done. And, and so I'd be remiss if I didn't you know, personally thank them and all county staff for all the work they've done, as well as this board. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's all I have. I do have in front of the board this evening, I have um, at, at your desk, we did last month, I did leave with you a draft budget calendar. Uh, in terms of potential budget upcoming work sessions. Um, and of course, last month I just uh, handed that out to the board. We will need to make some definitive um, decisions with this budget calendar so we can begin lining up our departments as we begin our budget work uh, after the first of the year. It doesn't necessarily have to be decided this evening, 
but I know we have the January 3rd and 5th meeting. Uh, it may be uh, very time compressed for the board uh, to hold a work session on the 10th or 12th. We, we do, at this point, plan to hold a work session uh, if uh, with the board on January the 17th, your regular board meeting, um, specifically to go over by that point in time, speaking with our finance director, we should have some revenue projection numbers. Right now we're in the revenue collection uh, season, and so we should have some good data uh, by the January 17th meeting. Likely, some of the more intensive uh, departments, when I say intensive, Mr. Uh, Ronnie Mitchell, you mentioned earlier uh, regarding apparatus and some of those large discussions. We do know a public safety session specifically to follow up on the work that was done in the summer, but more specifically also, uh, as Mr. Nick Mitchell uh, pointed out, to, to address some of the operational uh, demands and concerns, but also the capital. Uh, and so at the January 17th meeting, uh, at a very minimum, I expect that we will look to uh, discuss our revenue projections, but, but also maybe in the context of that's the pleasure of the board to, to dive in at that point on public safety, fire, EMS, um, potentially law enforcement as well. Those are our larger departments and, and certainly take up a good amount of the budget. And then thereafter, um, you'll see there's Tuesdays and Thursdays on your calendar as an example the 24th and 26th that's a Tuesday and Thursday and just as we did last year we're not ex necessarily expecting to meet on Tuesday and Thursday of every week but we did that in case there was inclement weather on the Tuesday we could hold that on the Thursday and so between January 17th uh, you know the week of the 24th the 31st the 7th and the 14th that's a that's a solid five work session potential work sessions and I do think that we can it, it's up to the Board of Supervisors certainly of, of how much time you'd like to hear from the various departments and so forth so um, w we do have those tentatively set uh, I will say by February 21st that's the absolute date uh, that we may need to pause because me and the staff will need uh, at least a week couple of weeks week and a half to prepare the budget which we at this point to meet our obligations with tax rate notices and so forth in April, we plan to present on March the 7th, very similar uh, calendar as last year. Uh, now that we have twice your tax collections, it is more compressed. Uh, and then at that point, there is some time in the month of March, then leading up to a uh, public hearing in late March, March 28th, to have other work sessions follow up after the budget has been presented, similar to last year. So. Uh, Mr. Vice Chair, members of the board, I leave this with you again. We don't necessarily have to confirm everything today, but I did want to leave this with you again on January 3rd that we can go ahead because uh, we, we do need to start lining up our various departments. But for now, uh, it looks like the January 17th on revenue projections and potentially the public safety portion of the budget and follow-up work session. I appreciate give this list. I know... Uh, Last month, you heard from a couple of uh, board members that they don't particularly like all these meetings. But me personally, I like to hear from the, not calling our staff horses, but I like to hear from the horse's mouth what he needs. And uh, I, that way, nothing can be lost in translation. So I appreciate these meeting opportunities that we can have to. Now, if they don't want to come, that's, that's up to them. But I, I appreciate allotting them the time to come and, and make their presentation. Now, I will say this, just relay to them that they don't have to go to, through a lot of historical data. You know, we need to know their needs and, and, and you know, give us some background on what, the, what those needs are and how we can help. Uh, I think that's our duty as a board is once that need is identified, we need to do everything we can to meet it if it, if it serves the citizens of Franklin County. So thank you for the list. Mm -hmm. Mr. Vice Chair, can I make a quick sure comment? Um, on a personal note, um, I had the um, occasion to have to utilize uh, Franklin County public safety uh, and more specifically the Scruggs Rescue. Um, and I just want to convey my gratitude and thanks for the professionalism that was demonstrated, the care and the passion that was demonstrated for my daughter. And um, I was very, I was, you know, a worried mama, 
but um, with my supervisor's hat on, I felt very, very blessed um, that we've got the caliber of folks we have attending to our citizens. So I just publicly wanted to say thank you. Anyone else have anything before we adjourn until January the 3rd? Gwen, do you have anything before we go? No, well, thank you, Beth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to take this opportunity again to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and, and a safe New Year's. And to my fellow board members, Merry Christmas. And Merry Christmas. Don't eat too much, Ronnie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else. The, we are okay. adjourned until January 3rd at 3 o'clock. That's correct. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas.